Good morning and welcome to a work session for the Anne Arundel County Council. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Yes, good morning, everyone. Ms. Lacey. Present. Ms. Pickard. Present. Mr. Volke. Rounding out the North County contingent, District 3 is present. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pruski. Mr. Pruski has not yet joined the meeting. Ms. Fiedler. Ms. Fiedler has not Good yet morning. joined the Welcome meeting. Welcome to a work session for Ms. the Rodney. Anne Arundel County Council. Madam Secretary, would you um, please call Rodney the roll? has not yet joined our yes. meeting. Good morning, everyone. Ms. Hare. Ms. Lacey. Present. Present. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Hewitt. Present. In honor of Mr. Council Mr. Member Pruski, I'm going Rounding to say here, Brother District 3 is present. Thank you. Okay. Thank Ms. Susan Mr. Smith. Pruski. Mr. Pruski has not yet joined the meeting. Okay. I see we have Ms. Ms. Fiedler, Fiedler here. Ms. Fiedler. Present. Ms. Fiedler has not Good yet morning. joined Welcome the meeting. Welcome to a work okay. session for Ms. the Rod, Madam Chair, we have everyone Madam present. Secretary, Mr. Would you please call the roll? Rod, not yet. And Madam Otter. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Our first item on our agenda is a presentation in honor of the Anne Arundel County Public Schools and Joint Initiative to Eliminate the Opportunity Gap Report. Ms. Purcell, I should say Dr. Purcell, excuse me. There we go. Good, good morning, good morning. So I'm, I'm Jennifer Purcell, I'm Director of Special Projects in the County Executive's Office. First, I'd like to thank you, Chairwoman Lacey, um, and members of the county council for the time this morning. I know you've got a very busy agenda ahead of you today. Thank um, you. Second, I'd like to introduce the team of women that I've had the pleasure to work with since the county executive and the superintendent announced Our core planning team includes Dr. Pam Brown, who's the executive director of the Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families. Deputy Purcell? Superintendent Mona Jackson, uh, Anne Arundel County Public Schools Executive, Executive Director of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement, Dr. Rachel Gillens, and the School Systems office. Director of First, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Heidi Ogilvie. Um, and the Doctors Brown, Ogilvie, and Gillens will be presenting to you today. Ms. Jackson and I are also here to answer questions. Um, second, I'd like to and we also have a new and very welcome addition to our core planning team. Her name is Ms. Ms. Uh, Trachelle Cherry. She's a recent graduate of Randolph-Macon College and returned to her home uh, of Anne Arundel County to begin her career just uh, this past January. She's gonna bring to this group a perspective of someone much younger than the rest of us uh, and someone who's out, outside of the system. So we look forward to her participation. Um, I wanna thank you again for allowing us to present. And if you wanna start the slides now, um, we'll just go through the agenda. Is it there? I, I'm right now just seeing a menu. Jennifer, it is up. I've shared my screen. Can you see it? I don't actually see the slide. I, I see I see a list of the um, like Windows Explorer with a list of files. Okay. Hang on one sec. Let's try this again. So while, uh, while we work on getting the slides up, I'll just uh, say, so this is what the report looked like. Uh, we presented this to the public back on uh, November 30th, and I hope you had the opportunity to read it. There we go, I can see the slides now. Perfect, for some reason it didn't wanna come up as a PowerPoint show, I'm not sure why, but let's do it this way. Sounds good, sounds good. So you can go to the next slide. What we're gonna do just this morning is give you a very brief uh, overview of the purpose, our process, and we wanna look at the four priority recommendations that came from the group. Um, we're gonna share our plan moving forward. We wanna, we've want we got a few short-term goals and a timeline, plus a, a brief list of our current uh, initiatives. And finally, the last thing we wanna do this morning is ask for your support. So uh, next slide. Dr. Ogilvie now is gonna get us started. Good morning. 
The next two slides will review the process and intentional work the committee completed over the last 16 months. As noted in the executive report, the group is comprised of a number of county officials, school district personnel, community leaders, community members, and other key stakeholders. The process began with the collection, tabulation, and synthesis of a plethora of data. During their initial phase of work, we fielded calls, emails, and letters from the community members and stakeholders. Next, we created five subcommittees that were responsible for crafting goals designed to address and ultimately mitigate our challenges. The whole team and the smaller committee groups continue to meet and enlist feedback from the community throughout the duration of our timeline. The full committee met five times over the course of 12 months with subcommittees meeting more frequently. The committee provided a midterm progress report during a second community meeting in February of 2020. Just one month later, the coronavirus pandemic shuttered government buildings requiring subcommittee work to continue virtually. COVID-19 exacerbated many of the current causes of the opportunity gap and reconfirmed the committee's emphasis of the essential roles of the school system, other government agencies, community residents, and families working in collaboration to improve outcomes for students caught in the gap. As a group, we've read best practice documents and scholarly research to support our thinking and design work. Lastly, we maintained a repository of resources that are archived for all to review and access. Next slide. Our very deliberate and results-driven work yielded five subcommittees, greater than 20 meetings, 14 goals, 78 strategies, and four priority recommendations. Thank you. Next slide. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here this morning to talk about the work of all of the people who are involved in this report. And I think it's really important to stress that hundreds of residents were part of this, all the way from the police chief down to a young man who lived in lives, still lives in public housing. So while you see our group of fine women who have just done a, a tremendous amount of work and I'm so proud to be part of, this really is um, an enormously complex piece of work with hundred, hundreds of your residents taking part. The four recommendations are really a distillation of hundreds of pages of work, hundreds of discussions, some of them extremely active, that were broken down in five subcommittees. And I think what's important about that is that they were the curriculum committee, the discipline committee, but we also got into some of the underlying issues around the opportunity gap, systemic racism and the social determinants. What's most important about the four recommendations is that they require collaboration between the school system, the county and the local community. And this is a really important point. Nobody owns this on their own. The opportunity gap is not the responsibility of the school system alone. Every system contributes to what happens to African-American children before they're born and all the way through their lives. And so this notion that we're all responsible and we all have to take our part is really ingrained in the recommendations that we're going to make. The, the four recommendations are really to do with the structural and systemic issues. It's easy to sort of chip away at the gap and talk about this little bit and that little bit. But the group itself, the large group, and this very small group, we're very concerned that we really start to get to the very fabric that causes this issue. And most importantly, they build both accountability and sustainability into the work. Next slide, please. So here they are, and they look so simple when I look at them. The very first one was to establish a coalition of stakeholders. And this coalition is really going to work together. It's going to be an appointed body. It's going to be semi-independent, we hope, and it's going to advise you and the county council and the sorry the school board and the community we really want to work on mitigating the effects of the social determinants of education so they're the things that happen to kids long before they walk into the school system anything from 
being born at low birth weight, the sort of adverse childhood experiences and frankly adverse community experiences they might have had, all of the health inequities that we know and document, all of those pieces. Obviously, that's for all of us to struggle with, not just here, but across the nation. Our third is to really increase transparency and accountability by making sure that our information is open to the public. We talk a lot about transparency, but what we don't do very well is to give very simple information through data that is disaggregated by race and ethnicity. If all we do as a group is push that forward, I personally will be very, very pleased. And then finally, we're going to try to establish a practice of preparing a documented equity analysis. I'm very pleased to see that the Maryland legislature is now working on that. And it makes me feel like that there's really great hope here. But there should be an equity analysis for all of our proposed policies and decisions, no matter where, whether it's the county council, the school board, or many of the other bodies that manage our work. And I think, next slide, please. That might be it for me now. So just to finish by saying that we, the four, the, now the six of us, really believe that these recommendations, recommendations have the best chance of addressing the systemic issues that lead to the opportunity gap for our children. I think that we have struggled, we have argued, we have come together, and we have become a really bonded and respectful group. We are diverse, we are women, and we, all of us say to you, we think that what we have recommended have got the absolute best chance to address the systemic issues that underlie all of the things that are happening to our children. So with that, I think that is it, it Jen, right? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Brown. Next slide, please. So we recognize that it will take time to meet all four recommendations of the report. However, we have created short-term goals. They are to obtain support from the Board of Education of Anne Arundel County and the County Council. We gained the support of the Board of Education on January 20th, and we are here today to gain your support. We intend to formalize the coalition of stakeholders as outlined in recommendation number one. And lastly, we will be identifying low hanging fruit. These are actions that are attainable with little to no cost. Next slide. Recommendation one is to establish and empower an independent coalition of stakeholders, including those who with lived experiences of the issues to provide ongoing review and oversight of structural and systemic racism that contributes to the opportunity gap in Anne Arundel County Public Schools and the county, and to recommend changes to address equity issues in academics and discipline. We have created a timeline that ranges from creating bylaws, appointing members, to assuring that the first coalition meeting takes place in July 2021. Next slide. For the low hanging fruit as one of our short term goals, the core eTalk leadership team reviewed the entire document and selected recommendations that are obtainable with little to no cost. Examples are listed here identifying communication strategies, improving access to libraries, and bringing equity officers across organizations together. Next slide. Some of the low hanging fruit was identified. These were items that were actually already in progress as indicated that's the item that's highlighted here. We were able to crosswalk the entire document for actions that are already in progress. So we've already seen success in many of the recommendations that have been made. And we are excited to continue with our short-term and long-term goals. Thank you. Next slide. So it's back to me, guys. I think many of you know that I'm a student of leadership 
and uh, and watch leaders and hold them accountable. This was this whole process was started by two leaders who understood the importance of collaboration and the frankly the importance of leadership on what has been a, a, a very very important topic over the last year and over the many years I've been doing this work. I'm really here to to finish this morning by asking you to support this work in a, a stronger way as you can in a, a collaborative way and in a united way because frankly when the chips are down that's what leaders do and so I'm very very proud of the work we've done this has been a, a very long-term project for me I've, I've been working on these issues for probably 30 years I think that this is as close as, as I'm going to get to a real opportunity to address not just the bits and pieces, but the pieces that live underneath this that continue to make it so difficult to address. So I ask you council members this morning, I know many of you and I'm very proud of your work to support this work and to support us as we move it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so that concludes the presentation and we uh, certainly will open up the floor for any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Purcell and Dr. Brown and everyone else who spoke. Do any of my colleagues have any questions at this time or comments? Madam Chair. Ms. Pickard. I've got to find my yellow flag. Good morning, everybody. And I want to thank you all very much for being here with us this morning. I've had the opportunity to review the, the document. It's, it's very comprehensive. Um, I appreciate the work. I served on the committee in a very, very minor way, um, but I am I, I am um, interested to hear. I hear that the board of ed supported the effort. I know we have, uh, I believe, voted unanimously to bring on a equity officer. I'm messing up that title in the county. Um, so when you talk about bringing those folks together, can you give me a little bit more um, who those folks are across agencies? Have they been identified already? I don't know who, want, who wants to take that question. Um, so they have not all been identified. And obviously Dr. Gillens, um, from the, the school system and her team would be part of that. Um, and yes, the uh, we are currently in the process at the county of, uh, of reviewing the resumes we've received for that director position. I believe it's the director of diversity, equity and inclusion, um, who will be responsible for really kind of pulling together all of those initiatives, equity related initiatives in the county. Um, we have not identified particular individuals uh, from the community side yet. Um, I believe that that might be one of the areas where we wait for the coalition to to pull through and um, make some recommendations for us. So if I could yeah. follow up. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Ms. Jackson. No problem. And just to add to that, I um, absolutely agree. And the essential premise behind that, Ms. Pickard, is, is that our children are with us in the school system for part of the day, but then they go into a community in which we are all influenced um, as such. And with that, um, the policies and practices that we create as a community um, really intersect and influence each other. And that would be the essential premise behind this um, collaboration. And I think that Dr. Purcell is absolutely correct that Dr. Gillens and our team at the school system, um, in addition to um, other uh, organizations and groups within the county would have a direct um, uh, influence upon those decisions. Thank you. I'm really, I'm really excited about this work. Um, I guess my question was, I know we have the county, the, uh, the, the hiring is in, is in process for the county at the administrative level, at the county executives level, but I gather we have equity professionals in some of our other, I know we've got the whole team at the school system, but do we have professionals in other areas like workforce development and ACDS? And is that sort of where you're going to be pulling from um, including just, you know, citizens and community members, other kinds of stakeholders. That was yes. my question, which I think you've answered. And I think I already knew the answer, but. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
especially including the community college, the police department, our systems are either in process or have people. And I think it's important, I think you're right, Councilwoman, to make sure that they are all part, because we're talking about the, the fabric. So we need, need the, all of those who are part of the fabric and are in formal positions to be part of that. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this work. It's, um, we have, we know that we have to get out of our silos to, to, to handle this work. It can't just be the school system. It can't just be the housing commission. It, it has to be really across all sectors of the community to, to serve our most vulnerable students and, and families, really. It's really about families, right? It's not just, um, so I, I'm grateful for your work. Um, I appreciated the the few meetings I attended. I didn't feel like I had much to offer in the curriculum committee, <laughs> but uh, I know there were some really amazing conversations happening, and this is it's a culmination of some really great work. So thank you. Does anyone else have a question or a comment? If not, I have one. I'm sure um, that you are aware that the county council cannot form any kind of uh, standing committee we just it's not authorized under the charter um, can you describe for us what you envision to be the ongoing potential involvement of the council or specific council members depending on whatever your efforts are at a given time um, obviously the budget and it sounds like um, if your initial focus is on the low hanging fruit, which I think is smart, um, then I think you're telegraphing that you don't have a large budget request this year. And perhaps you have, you know, an, an idea of a bigger one for next year. Um, I'm not asking for the details of that versus just what what you so far have envisioned as an ongoing role for the county council because you know, we we can do resolutions. We we do them. We do them all the time, and we can express support. But I don't know how meaningful it really will be, um, unless there's there's something else you can tell us about what what you think we should be doing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brown. I'll I'll jump in on the first part. Which okay, will be I'll put you on the second. You go. <laughs> which will be the the budget request. And yes, you're absolutely right. We are not coming to you with any budget request this year. Um, we believe that the way we're structuring things, we can make some impact this first year um, with the resources that we currently have. Um, also, the role of the, the coalition, which is what I think uh, Dr. Brown can also give a little more detail on what we're envisioning, um, will be to look at the remainder of the recommendations and help us prioritize those. Um, they'll also help us determine how we can implement some of these more long-term um, long recommendations. Um, so yes, we will probably come with a budget request for next fiscal year. Um, Dr. Brown, you wanna take the second part? <laughs> Sure. So I think for, for the next, at least until June 30th, Councilwoman Lacey, we, we are going to be sort of slogging through the details of how to create an implementation plan. And I would think the importance of the council during that time is to support in it and to lead us through it. We will keep coming back to you with where we are, what we're doing, what's coming next. But for me, the importance of this for the council is in the leadership through it the support of it, the talking it up, the speaking with one voice, because that's really what we need. We can be at the bottom of the work doing the nitty gritty and, and all of the stuff that, that, that really takes a lot of time, but the, the, the role of leadership is to stand up and push it forward. And so we will be coming to you regularly to ask for just that. Thank you. Colleagues, anyone else want to speak up? We're a quiet bunch this morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last chance. Um, well, Madam Chair, if, if yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to to say that I will be proud to to work on a resolution of of support of the current report. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how long that will take us to get together and I will work to secure if I can the the support of all seven colleagues. Um, 
as we get started on this initiative. So look for that in the in the near future. We are a busy lot right now, but um, this is important. And so I, I feel um, I can put a resolution forward of, of general support for the work that's already been done and, and looking to the future. So we'll, we'll um, work on that as a council um, in the next coming weeks. And um, I look forward to, to how you pull this um, coalition together. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman Pickard. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And I appreciate your coming this morning, your time and your coordination. And with that, we'll move on to the next item of our agenda. Madam Chair, I do want to note for the record that Mr. Prusky has joined the meeting and Madam Auditor has also joined the meeting. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to discussing legislation. The first item on our legislation agenda is bill number 521, County Executive Bill, Administration Bill. Mr. Barron, there you are. Would you like to talk to us about bill 521? I would be happy to, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, joining me uh, from budget is Mr. Taru. Uh, from the schools, we should have Mr. Shaknovich and Mr. Stansky. And from a law, Ms. Lori Blair Klausmeyer. Uh, bill 5 21 is the Board of Education Transfer Bill. Uh, I do want to flag one issue for the council. This bill is scheduled for a hearing at the next meeting that does conflict with um, the uh, our, our representatives here from AACPS. So if they, um, you know, if, if the council feels that we have more questions and we'll need our school system experts that, um, you know, either myself or Mr. Taru uh, can't answer. Um, we would kindly ask your support to hold the bill uh, to the next meeting if if we feel if we can get all our questions out this morning and, it, and if we go on the hearing uh, at the next meeting and, and we feel good that uh, a, this is a pretty uh, routine uh, matter, uh, then we would ask you to move the bill. So I'll leave that to the wisdom of the council. Um, but now I'll, I'll ask Mr. Shaknovich to tell you a little bit more about what's included in Bill 5-21. Thank you and good morning, members of the council. I'm joined uh, this morning by Mr. Matthew Stansky, our uh, Director of Financial Operations, and I'm Alex Shaknovich, the Chief Operating Officer. Uh, we collaborate uh, annually uh, midway through the year with your Office of Budget and the County Auditor uh, to bring forward a supplemental uh, appropriation bill that essentially recognizes revenues that we've received uh, during the first half of the year that was unanticipated at the time of budget adoption. Uh, this uh, bill this year is a little bit unique in that um, it does recognize the new revenues, and I'll speak to that a little bit, about $2.8 million of new revenues. However, it also has a revenue essentially transfer from the FY20 budget to the FY21 budget of $4.5 million of appropriations that were designated for the FY20 budget. However, because of the uh, COVID influence uh, alteration in our business model after the 13th of March, uh, those dollars were not able to be expended in the manner in which they were uh, originally contemplated. And therefore, uh, because of that and decisions made by the federal and state government, we're allowed to carry those dollars forward across the fiscal years. Uh, so those FY20 dollars are going to be reappropriated into the FY21 budget. The high level uh, overview is that there are zero uh, dollars, uh, zero cents that are impacted within the unrestricted part of our operating budget. And therefore there are no unrestricted changes at all to 
to either federal, state, local, or uh, county contributions. All of these uh, transactions are on the restricted, uh, AKA grant side of the ledger. And essentially the combination of new revenues and uh, carryover revenues, again, that are permissible from FY 20 to 21 has the net effect of the following. In the restricted federal revenue source category, our appropriations would increase by $6,134,500. From the state, again, in our restricted category, the net effect would be an increase of $925,800 for FY21. And local, we would have an increase of 299,600. And I wanna point out local does not mean county. Uh, these are both actually LDC grants that were awarded uh, back in FY20. But again, because of our uh, modality of operations after March, they were not uh, able to be fully executed in the FY20 year. And therefore working with the county and the LDC, those dollars are being reappropriated. Uh, in the local category. There is no uh, change at all to the county contribution, again, in the uh, restricted side. Uh, we'll certainly be prepared to go through any of the details. I know uh, budget and audit have been through the numbers as well as the uh, county comptroller's office. And with that, Madam President, we'll turn the floor back over to you and your colleagues. Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Mr. Seknovich, I'm looking at Section 2 here, and it looks like we are removing almost $1.3 million from the Special Education Fund. Could you just touch on that for a minute and help me understand? Sure. Uh, again, Alex Seknovich, the Chief Operating Officer. Uh, we were required uh, at the base to realign 15% of our uh, special education funding. The net effect is actually there's going to be an increase to the special ed category uh, when everything is to the state category of special education. Uh, but there's some internal adjustments uh, that were required in the IDEA uh, line item of us by the federal and state government. And is that part of the below what's under section three? Yes. Where would I see that in section three? So I know the auditor uh, took a, a look at the various line items, but in the special ed category, uh, there is a uh, $234,300 reduction to our, as a result of our elementary and secondary school education relief fund. And then there is a $1,043,000 reduction to our individual with disabilities act funding. Uh, so these are funding source adjustments. These aren't adjustments being made by us, the school district, because we wish to, to spend the monies elsewhere. They're a direct reflection of the funding source. Uh, but again, when you take it in totality, our special ed state category uh, in the end is increasing with all the various funding sources. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I have one more question unless somebody else has. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Seknovich, can you help me understand um, under section three, what is, what are you using? I mean, the money for textbooks, classroom supplies, and other instructional costs, that's um, most of the money. Can you help me just understand kind of what that's going towards in this transfer? Sure. Um, so this is a combination of a number of state grants that we have, and I can you know slowly walk through them uh, with you. We've got the uh, Coronavirus uh, Aid Relief and Economic Security or CARES Act. Uh, which is the Educational Stabilization Fund. Uh, that is monies that are provided to local school districts and the charter schools um, to uh, provide equitable services to students and teachers, again, uh, in the public and non-public school arena. Uh, we've received funding for uh, tutoring services to implement tutoring programs um, to meet 
specific criteria from the state and federal government to compensate for learning loss for students. Uh, we've received funding for distance learning programs. Um, that is both software, hardware, and connectivity funding in terms of a coronavirus technology program relief act. Uh, we did receive a small amount of funding from the governor's office under the governor's emergency education relief act and that is to provide again distance education and remote learning for students uh, we received a small about fifty fifty three thousand dollars from uh, the office of housing community development for rural broadband and off-premises uh, connectivity we received uh, funding again under the governor's uh, emergency education relief fund to provide uh, funding for academic accessibility for at-risk students. are challenged in terms of having the supply and materials uh, to keep up with their instructional requirements. Okay, I'm not sure why it looks like everybody's come in and out, but hopefully everyone heard what Mr. Sheknovich had to say. Does anyone else have any questions? Madam Chair. Mr. Prusky. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheknovich. Good morning, Andrew Prusky. Uh, district four uh, can you provide an update in regards to the one-to-one -one in terms of devices um, I, I don't know if you have that answer to the question but i'd be curious if um, heard a lot in terms of the state obviously we're all remote learning and we're looking at a hybrid but i'm just curious on Anne arundel's status in terms of one-to-one uh, -one outdated devices uh, devices on order um, i know every single school district in the country is ordering chromebooks right now so good luck trying to get them overnight but if you could just provide a general update, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so we have uh, ordered and received enough devices such that any student, uh, Councilman Frisky, uh, that, it, that needs or has sought a device uh, has access to one now. Uh, we are not one-to-one -one per se in terms of our student devices in hand, and that is largely due to the fact that uh, many of our students and families, Councilman Frisky, have elected to use their own devices. They have elected not to receive uh, an Anne Arundel County Public School issue device. Uh, we have concurred with that decision and will allow students to use their own devices, at least through the balance of this academic year. We have made no determination in terms of where we are going to be uh, next, uh, next uh, September, Labor Day. Uh, but we do have additional devices on order, uh, we certainly want to make sure that, again, we have enough AACPS devices uh, such that any student that would want one has one. Additionally, when we reopen the next academic year, uh, Councilman Prusky, um, our older students, and, and older does also include elementary schools, are capable and proficient and can, you know, bring computers between the classroom and schools. Uh, on a daily basis without much issue or concern. Uh, but for some of our youngest students, 
uh, that that may be a challenge. Uh, and also, we obviously want to make sure that the devices are protected, undamaged, et cetera. Uh, so we are, uh, Councilman Prisby, contemplating upping our inventory of Chromebooks at the elementary school level. Again, that decision's not been finalized, and it also is predicated on some budgetary and supply chain issues. But we are looking to uh, up the amount of devices we have available at the elementary school level such that uh, maybe not all of our elementary school students will have to transport their devices from home to school and school to home uh, once we begin uh, the next academic year. Thank you. Any other colleagues questions? Oh, <laughs> Ms. Fiedler, your flag <laughs> fades into the background. I think it's part of your shelves, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And um, thank you. So I actually had two questions. Um, my first question is on section three and um, the third largest uh, line item, which is the operation of plan. So when I think of operation of plan, I think of the brick and mortar. Is that an accurate picture? Or is it something else? Sure. Uh, again, Alex Schechner, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, in this case, Councilman Beeler. Uh, that is where we have our PPE supply acquisition, uh, be they uh, uh, masks, uh, face shields, uh, sanitization products, um, things okay. like, uh, like hand sanitizer and, and Purell the, and wipes. So all of those type of things that you would categorize as, as PPE and additional sanitization elements by state rule fall into that uh, that state category. So that's okay. where those uh, funds and expenditures can be found. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then my second question um, was regarding this, the um, points that you noted about the materials um, that I think is item four in section three that are being um, sent to or picked up by families and taken to the homes. I have heard that um, even though they those materials get to the homes, they don't actually or don't always show up in the classroom. That kids are still um, coming to classes and don't have those materials, even though that they they were picked up. So, do you have any idea of the percentage of students who, for whatever reason, the materials aren't making it to the virtual classroom, um, even though they're in the household? And is there a way to try to, to mitigate and improve that? Quite honestly, I, I, I don't miss Beeler. That's okay. on the budget side of the house. That's certainly something I can inquire about. I know that uh, all of the uh, all of the students were provided with an efficient, uh, sufficient, you know, essentially starter kits, and they were instructed that uh, if they ran low or if they needed supplemental supplies. To reach out to their principal and their principal had the capacity uh, to backfill some of those so okay. it, certainly it's not a supply issue um, but honestly what's occurring within an individual's household side I'd struggle to answer again I'd be more than happy to to ask about uh, that and get back to you under separate cover okay thank you anyone else No, looking like it. Thank you all for joining us this morning and we're going to move on to our next bill. Next is bill number 621. Madam Chair, you ready for me? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm sure am. I thought we were waiting for your people. <laughs> Go good, ahead. Good morning again. Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, joining me from budget is Ms. Molden, from finance, Ms. McQuaid, and from law, Ms. Blair Klausmeyer. Um, Bill 621 is uh, the Millburr Special Community Benefit District approval of loan and assignment agreement. Uh, the current uh, bill is for the purpose of levying the special community benefit assessment to repay a loan in the amount of $117,000 made by Sandy Spring 
bank to the Milberg Club. The, the loan is to fund the reconstruction of a community bulkhead and pier, which that, and that use complies with their uh, statutory purpose of the Special Community Benefit District. The term of the loan is five years. Uh, uh, the SCBD has included the first payment in the proposed FY22 budget request contingent on this council's approval. Any costs the county will incur in administering the multi-year payment of the loan will be offset by the administrative fee. With that, uh, happy to answer any questions. And Milper is in District 3, I believe. Anyone who wishes to speak? Seeing no flags, hearing no one speak up. I think we have no questions on this bill, Mr. Barron. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, then we will move on to bill number 721, which is um, Ms. Pickard and Mr. Prusky's bill. So as sponsors, whichever of you would like to go first, please go ahead. Sure, good morning. Thank you. This is Allison Pickard, D2. Bill 7-21 is um, sort of a follow-up to the um, some of the housing bills we had last spring. Um, you may or may not recall the conversation about caregivers, caretakers being able to live in um, uh, housing for elderly with moderate means and other kinds of uh, housing. So this is just um, inserting that language into the code to keep us compliant with fair housing and other laws. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but I do believe we have some folks here to answer any questions. Um, Mr. Barron, would the administration like to chime in at this time? Thank you, uh, uh, Councilwoman Pickard. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, joining me uh, at the virtual table is Ms. Miller from OPZ, Ms. Gowan from Aging, and uh, Ms. Blair Klaus Meyer sticks around from law. Um, Seven, as Councilwoman Pickard said, 7 21 is pretty straightforward. I want to thank uh, the sponsors, uh, councils, council uh, for working with uh, our office to craft this bill. It will change current county code to include housing for the elderly of moderate means to allow a live in caretaker who may be under the age of 62 for a resident with a disability in a unit that is uh, to be occupied by individuals who are 62 years of age or older. Um, so uh, like Councilwoman Pickard said, this is, this is about fair housing. This is about caring for our, our seniors um, and our disabled. So with that, happy to answer any questions, but the administration supports and appreciates uh, the collaborative effort in crafting this bill. I have a question, um, whether for the sponsors or Mr. Barron, do we have an estimate of how many county residents will be positively impacted by this bill? Just curious. Um, Pete Barron with the administration, um, Ms. Gowan might be the best equipped to give us uh, an estimate, maybe. Sorry to put you on the spot, Ms. Gowan, but I do not know off the top of my head. So, hi, um, Madam Chair, honored members of council for the record, Carissa Gowan, Department of Aging and Disabilities Director. Um, I don't have an estimate of the number of, um, of uh, individuals that will be impacted. Um, I can say that in the state of Maryland, um, the in-kind contribution of a family caregiver is about $9.3 billion. Uh, so we support this bill um, as it allows people to age in place rather than um, have to rely on a more institutional setting. Thank you. Colleagues, questions, comments? Seeing none, okay, thank you everyone. And we're going to move on 
to bill number 821. Is that my cue to go, Madam Chair? Um, yes, Ms. Fiedler, I'm sorry. I'm switching between overlapping <laughs> windows here to make sure I know where I am. And yes, yes, you can. That is okay, thank you. So um, Bill 821 is a bill that came from a situation in the fifth district, but certainly could apply to any situation where a community um, organization and individual riparian rights are in question. It essentially creates a checkbox on the application that if there were questions about the riparian rights for the building of a pier, um, this checkbox uh, would give the Office of Planning and Zoning a tool, a stopgap, if you will, um, to hit the pause button on construction um, and let the parties uh, figure out exactly who has the riparian rights. I will be introducing an amendment um, at our first meeting and I just wanna thank the Office of Law um, and Office of Planning and Zoning for their work on this. The amendment would add an additional mechanism of notification prior to construction even beginning, but um, that is not here before us this, this morning. I just wanted to make a note of it and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Would the administration like to respond or comment? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is an important issue. Um, we are um, well aware of, of some of the issues that have cropped up uh, in the past year or two and, and how the law does need to catch up to uh, the practical needs for the county and for um, the community. A, a lot of work uh, goes into protecting our shorelines and we need to make sure that our law and and we have the tool. The, our law gives us the tools to um, make sure that we, when we do things like shoreline restoration projects, we are able to um, complete them and protect the communities. Those projects, which cost a lot of money, um, are there for. So uh, I'll I'll see if. Um, Anyone on the administration uh, side, I think Mr. Africa wants to, to say a word or two, but um, appreciate the, the collaborative spirit in working on this legislation. Greg Africa, Dir Director of Inspections and Permits. Um, uh, actually, this, this is the purview of INP and not OPZ. Uh, we are the ones who issue the permits. So having a another level of uh, certification that the property owner who is applying for a permit has riparian rights will um, will definitely work out all the, the kinks before any any conflict happens and therefore we don't have to cancel a permit later on down the line we can address the issue before uh, construction is a, is approved to proceed thank you Thank you, Mr. Africa. Do any of my colleagues have questions? Doesn't seem to be anyone. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today. We're going to move on to bill number 921. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll just start talking again. Um, so Bill 921 actually came from our discussion on Bill 321, which was also a bill in um, addressing the civil emergency section of our code. In that discussion, I mentioned that the um, civil emergency powers in our code were uh, developed in the 60s and have not really been updated since. We are the first council to grant um, the very first extend, extension request from a county executive. Um, so I thought that it was very important to look back um, on the past year and update this section of the code. I also took into consideration that the governor has to renew his state of emergency every 30 days. 
Um, 30 days is a little problematic for this council because of our um, calendar year and that we recess for an entire month. So I um, made it such that a civil emergency could still be granted beyond seven days, but could only last for up to 45 days, at which point uh, the, any county executive would have to start the process all over again by declaring a civil emergency, then coming back to the council for another extension to go beyond seven days. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Fiedler. Would the administration like to respond, Ms. Brand? Thank you, Madam Chair, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, joining me is Mr. Swain, and I think we have some folks in the wings. Um, it's come to surprise, the administration opposes the bill. Uh, this would limit the county executive's ability to respond to the public health crisis that is uh, still ongoing. Do my colleagues have any questions, Mr. Volpe? Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Mr. Barron, I, uh, I hear what you're saying. Can you explain in detail exactly how this bill, if passed, would limit the county executive's ability to respond to the health crisis? Uh, again, um, Councilman Volke, the, the, the health crisis is still ongoing. We are rolling out vaccines. Uh, currently, we are providing assistance. We are using the emergency powers to respond to the crisis in numerous ways. And, you know, I think we've provided plenty of information to this council and I'm happy to continue to provide additional information. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Volke, sorry. Thank you, Nathan Volke, District 3. Mr. Barron, I, I understand what you all are doing and I appreciate the information you've provided to the council. I think. The question or, or the crux of what I'm getting at is this is a really simple bill. It says that every 45 days you've got to come before the council and continue to ask the council if you can keep this state of emergency in effect. Um, one of the concerns that you've expressed on behalf of the administration on a number of other bills that have dealt with this similar topic is that you won't be able to act if you have to come to the council for approval to do specific things. This doesn't require that. This simply says every 45 days if the state of emergency is in effect, you keep coming in front of the council and we keep either renewing it or not. So I'm not sure how in any way this would impact your ability to respond to the pandemic because this isn't micromanaging you on specific things. It's not asking you to come back to the council and get permission to do things. It's literally saying every 45 days, you know it like clockwork, just bring another reauthorization request in front of the council and the council decides if it's still appropriate to keep the state of emergency in effect or not, uh, the civil emergency civil emergency, I should say. So I'm just, I'm still a little baffled how the administration feels this is gonna handicap them. And if you can give me some specific information on how it would help me in assessing this bill. I mean, I think I, I Councilman Volke, Pete Barron with the administration, I think I've made a, a couple of points before and I'll continue to say that we are on, in the middle of an ongoing response to an unprecedented pandemic. I mean, this is, it's been, over a century since we've had to deal with the pandemic. We need, um, we, the county, the, the right place for this is with the executive and the county has um, been very responsive to council members' requests for information. We'll continue to provide information. I, I don't see how this aids in any way the, the response to the public health needs of the county. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple couple questions and, and one comment. The first comment is when the governor renews the state of emergency every month, he doesn't go before the legislator. He just does that. He has the executive power to just renew the state of emergency every 30 days. Second, I did have a question for Mr. Swain. So if this bill were to pass, does this retroactively affect the current um, civil emergency that we're in? I may, Madam Chair. Well, this. I'm uh, Greg Swain, County Attorney. Mr. Swain. Yeah, thank you. Um, Greg Swain, County Attorney. Um, well, if this bill passed, it wouldn't be effective until 45 days um, after passage. So, it, it, depending on what that date would be going forward, um, 
it, it appears that it would seven days from that 45th day, once the bill becomes effective, that the emergency would expire unless it was extended. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I ask my second question? Yes. So when we, as the, as the code is currently written, when the county executive, any county executive comes before the council to ask for that or, or pass the bill to extend, do we have the authority to put a timeline on it now beyond seven days or do we need this 45 day provision in the code? Could we already do this as the way the code is written? Am I being clear? Sorry. Well, the code, the relevant code, okay. Um, hang on one second. I guess my question is, you know, for, because we made back in March, we made, or April, we made our civil emergency run concurrently with the state of emergency, at, at the governor's state of emergency. For, for this pandemic, that's how I view the way we, the county should be running. That's my opinion. If the next emergency, let's say, I like to use the example of a tsunami. <laughs> if a tsunami hits due to, you know, rapid climate change, and the seven days isn't enough and we want to extend it, can't we do that in the way we pass that next bill without, we could make 15 days, 60 days, 40, I mean, do, do we need, do we need this provision in the, thank you. Great, Swain County Attorney. Um, well, what the county code provision simply provides is that the uh, an emergency is not good for more than seven days unless there's an ordinance that extends it. So it could be extended for a fixed period of time. State law provides the same type of thing, although it says a local state of emergency can't continue for more than 30 days unless uh, authorized by an ordinance. So, you know, typically what's happened in the past is all the emergencies we've dealt with have been natural events that have a uh, determine uh, start and finish. So this has obviously been different because of the uncertainty of when it would be resolved. Um, so I think the council could say there's a state of emergency for a week or 30 days or whatever it might be. Um, but that's obviously not what happened in this case. So the ordinance changes that a little bit, but I think the council could do what the ordinance contemplates under the law as it's currently written. Thank you. So just in, in follow up. So I'm, I'm wondering, is this bill really about the next emergency or is this another attempt to end the current state of emer civil emergency in the county? I'm just trying to understand the, the motivation and intent of the sponsor. Thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I apologize. I'm getting a bit of a delay and frozen audio. So I did not hear that that question was directed to Mr. Swain. Um, so this is a very forward thinking um, bill. We know that all of our previous civil emergencies have been surrounding a natural event, uh, a weather event, if you will. And the history, the meeting minutes on the um, this section of our code becoming part of our code really indicate that the intent was for civil emergencies to be used for a brief period of time. I hope that we never have to live through a pandemic in our lifetime again. Um, and I, I certainly think that our job as legislators is to uh, re-examine sections of our code when we are living through them the first time. Um, I certainly don't want to put a post-it note on the wall of the 5th District Office to be a reminder in 100 years what happened in, two, in 2020. Um, so the most appropriate way to handle uh, what I think is a uh, lapse in our code is to introduce this bill. Um, it is not retroactive, as Mr. Swain said. Um, and I think th the second bigger part of this is that it would require any county executive in the future to come back and have a public discussion on the status of the civil emergency because things have changed daily, they've changed hourly, they've changed weekly. And those are all important factors when you're making a decision if it's appropriate to have a civil emergency or not. Um, so that that is all I have and I hope I've answered um, all of the questions. Thank you. Ms. Hare. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica here, District 7. This is, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, but um, when I had looked at this, I understood that it would not apply to the current um, state of emergency. At least that was how I read it, because the current state of emergency has already been extended coterminous with the governor's state of emergency. So, Mr. Swain, I know that you had said that this would impact it 45 days out. I, I read it differently that it would only apply to the next circumstance we might have as an appropriate check and balance on various forms of government. Um, I think it's important that the council and the executive branch, you know, constantly have that back and forth and that checks and balance. If my understanding is what Councilwoman Fiedler intended, I wonder if some language added to this bill that would clarify um, might alleviate Councilwoman Pickard's concerns or any other concerns that, that might exist, you know, for lack of a better term, grandfathering clause uh, for, for the current uh, circumstance, because I do see this as a, let's just make sure that any future emergency, whether it be a tsunami or something else, there's a regular check that comes back in um, between the legislative and the executive branch. Ms. Swain, Swain, Swain County you. Attorney. No, oh, yes. I, ahead, I, I agree. I think if the intent is to have the bill not apply to the current situation, there would need to be some language added to the bill to make to clarify that. Because I, in my opinion, looking at it, once it becomes effective, it would apply. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Would the administration be supportive of this bill if it had language in it to ensure <clears throat> that it did not apply to the current state of emergency. That's number one. And number two, my second question is, um, I, I heard Mr. Barron say that this authority appropriately rests with the executive. And I'm just confused by that. Maybe Mr. Swain can answer the question for the administration. But my understanding is that this power um, under the charter and under the code lies with the county council to grant to the county executive in emergencies. Um, so it's actually the county council's power that's been granted to the county executive. We have the power to extend the emergency or not. And that's the way it's set up. So the idea that somehow like this power is rightfully resting with the county executive, it does after we say it's okay. Um, that's my understanding. But if I'm wrong, somebody correct me. Yeah, uh, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, I'll, I'll take the last question first, Councilman Volke. I, I may have been a little inarticulate or imprecise. I was not referring to the authority to grant. It was talking about the authority to respond, uh, it's the appropriate place. Um, as to um, whether or not we would support if this did not affect a, a, the current emergency, that would definitely make the bill better, but uh, we would want to take a look at this in a, in a holistic way. I don't know what the impact of, of this bill would be. Um, the administration was not consulted before the bill was introduced, we have not seen language that would put um, uh, some clarity on on the concern that we have particular at the moment. So I won't be able to give you an answer, but I would promise to look at it. Madam Chair. Mr. Swain. Uh, Greg Swain, County Attorney. Um, the declaration of an emergency is an executive function the, extent, the extension of the declaration of emergency is a legislative function. Thank you, Mr. Swain. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've had a lot of conversations over the, the, the last year about civil emergencies and, and, and what the code says. So I, I think I've already stated that while this has been an enduring uh, uh, civil emergency and, and public health crisis, the next one could be very different and have a very different edges to it. Um, it seems to me the code already allows the council to put an end date on um, an emergency. So I'm, I'm just, is the 45 day arbitrary? Is it something this council, as we look at civil emergencies and the way the code is currently drafted, I think, I think we would serve the, the body and the county better if we took some time to look at this issue holistically. Without a crystal ball, we really don't know. So the next council, or, or maybe hopefully it's not this 
seven people sitting in our seats having to deal with another type of emergency. But it seems to me the council already has the ability to um, extend the civil emergency powers to any number of days. So why 45? That's that's my take on the whole thing. Thanks. Any other colleagues? Uh, Ms. Shewitt. Am I not muted now? Okay, I'm good. No. You're okay. good. Sorry. I think this question is directed to the county attorney because this is based on my memory. I'm not so sure it's accurate, but I think that the very first declaration that was entered was a proclamation of an emergency and that all of the subsequent um, um, executive orders, that's what I meant to say. I think I might, may have misspoken. Uh, all of the subsequent executive orders were pursuant to that initial declaration of, of emergency. Is that, do you know if that's true or not? Uh, Greg Swain, County Attorney. Um, the original proclamation of emergency um, was in March. That was extended by Bill 2420. Um, so that, and that emergency continues concurrent with the governor's declaration of emergency. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I'll just offer a comment listening to all this. I I think in general, the idea that Ms. Fiedler is proposing is reasonable, or at least it's certainly not unreasonable, but I wonder if at the very bottom of what we're talking about is the fundamental disagreement we may be having over whether there's actually an emergency and that that's maybe the more difficult question for us to try to answer. Um, sometimes we, it's like obscenity, you know it when you see it, tsunami, that's a disaster, <laughs> that's an emergency. Uh, pandemic where lots of people aren't getting sick, is that still an emergency? There's a lively public debate about that. Um, I think it's a topic that is worthy of more of more debate. I don't know how I feel about this specific solution, but I think the fact that we can have this debate um, is is healthy for our county. So, um, with that, unless anybody else has anything to say, we'll move on to Bill Number Ten Twenty One. Madam Chair, I do want to point out we're about 15 minutes away from needing to take a 90 minute break. Okay, I'm keeping that on my mind. Um, bill number 1021 is the CAO contingency fund bill, Mr. Barron. Hi. Good morning again, Pete Barron with the administration. I, I've got a whole um, cadre of folks who will be joining me at the virtual table uh, from budget, Mr. Taru, from health, Ms. Penley, from transportation, Ms. McGill, from ACDS, Ms. Koch, from emergency management, Ms. Emmerich, and from law, Ms. Blair Klausmeyer. Um, this is uh, a uh, important budget transfer bill. Um, we've seen a number of these in our time here, but there's some biggies in this one. So I'll, I'll give a quick overview and then we're happy to answer any specific questions council members may have. Um, so this bill recognizes 17 million uh, and 313,000 and change of U.S. Treasury Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Funds. This comes from the second federal stimulus. It's a direct allocation uh, to Anne Arundel County of the of 17 million and change out of the 400 and million or so that the, the state got. Um, section two is uh, some recognizing grant special revenues, uh, three grants in the health department for about 1.7 million for two COVID response grants and one grant for the gun violence intervention work uh, and three grants in uh, Department of Transportation totaling about a half a million dollars. Um, 
Although a match, there's no match um, required in in the the health department grants. There is a match uh, needed in the Department of Transportation grants, but due to grant sources already brought before this council, the grant match can be absorbed within existing appropriation. Um, and uh, we've got a transfer of about 150 million or 150,000, excuse me, to the Office of Emergency Management uh, for a consultant to assist in maximizing the reimbursement allowed uh, for COVID-19 expenditures through FEMA. Uh, the cost will ultimately be, ultimately be much uh, more than recouped once the county receives the reimbursement from FEMA. Um, 75,000 uh, transfer to the capital budget uh, to pay for an overage in uh, the Defenders Memorial uh, Capital Project. Um, and uh, with that, happy to have any of our folks here answer any questions council members may have. Colleagues? Any questions or comments? We're all very grateful that you guys are handling all of that. <laughs> okay, nobody seems to have anything to ask at this time. Thank you all for coming. We're gonna turn to the next bill. Bill number 1121. Um, Madam Chair. Uh, oh, sorry. It's just next numerically. I guess that's not what we're doing next. What are we doing next? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, bill number 1221. This is the uh, Glen Burnie Landfill Solar LLC. Just making okay. sure we're gonna come back to the GDP, right? The plan. Oh, of course we are. Of yes, course we okay. are. <laughs> I'm looking at two different documents to figure out what is going on here on my itty bitty screen today. <laughs> no, no worries. So um, I'm excited to bring uh, Bill 12-21. Uh, uh, once again, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, I got a whole bunch of folks here who've done a lot of hot, hard work on this one. So uh, I've got Matt Johnston, also from the county exec's office from Central Services, uh, Ms. Romans and Mr. Heim from DPW, Mr. Phipps and uh, Mr. Holtis. Uh, budget, I think we've got Mr. Trumbauer back and from law, Ms. Blair Klausmeyer. Um, so this is uh, uh, an exciting bill. Um, 1221, it's, it's the result of a lot of hard work by many, many folks in county government. But um, I want to extend a couple of special thank yous to the teams in Central Services and DPW for putting this together and for law for slugging through uh, rather complicated lease agreements. Um, and I do see Mr. Fetterman on screen. Sorry if I didn't recognize you, sir. Um, the, the bill will allow an almost 20 acre retired portion of the Glen Burnie landfill to generate revenue for the county and clean energy for our residents. Um, so what, what it does is the county, uh, what this 1221 will allow the county to execute a 25 year lease agreement uh, with uh, Glen Burnie uh, Landfill, which is a subsidiary of Amoresco, uh, who will build a four megawatt solar project on the unused site. Um, this will bring in revenues for the county um, and, and is exactly the type of solar development that the uh, administration would like to see more of in Anne Arundel County. It uses distressed or otherwise unused property uh, for solar energy, meaning we don't cut down forests or, or uh, use prime farmland. Uh, we have uh, our experts here who can answer any questions uh, it is a bit of a, a complicated deal, but it is uh, the very definition of a win-win for the county. Thank you, Mr. Barron. That's electric. Ms. Hare, questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. This is less of a question and more of just a comment. Um, I love this. 
the the concept of using brownfields to generate um, energy is not a new one, but it well it it is relatively it hasn't been sort of widely adopted, but if anyone wants an example, I know they did this with the city of Annapolis under Mayor Panalides. Um, it's been pretty pretty successful. And to my understanding, the way it worked there, and I think from reading these documents, the way it works here is essentially we generate um, money for for the property by leasing it to the electric company, the electric company, or the solar company rather, the solar company then generates the electricity. Um, in the city of Annapolis, the city of Annapolis then actually received some of that electricity at a very discounted rate. So they saved money on that front. And then the solar company makes the money because they can sell the electricity. So it's sort of a win for everyone. Um, and it's using an otherwise sort of unusable piece of property. So uh, this is awesome. I think there are six or so other brownfields when I had looked at this issue with a couple of constituents um, there are six or so other brownfields in the county that I think this might work on um, so anyways this was just to say I love this idea yay the administration would like to respond we agree <laughs> okay well I love the idea too does anybody else want to weigh in <laughs> Can we just vote yes, like right now? I mean, okay. Uh, apparently not. Does anybody have any questions still? Last call. Okay. Not seeing any questions. Um, this is fantastic. Thank you all for coming. We're gonna move along to bill number 1321. Okay, 1321 is the Board of Appeals rules bill, which is not nearly so electric, but is apparently at least as necessary. Um, Mr. Barron, do you want to speak to the bill? Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Pete Barron with the administration. It's my understanding that this is actually, uh, while we worked closely with the council members, this was actually driven um, by members of the council. Uh, and I was just, uh, uh, received a note from Ms. Corby, we should have, uh, the administration should have invited the Board of Appeals to this work session. Uh, it was an oversight on on our part to have them, uh, to not inform them of this uh, uh, meeting today. So I, I want to extend my apologies for, for missing that one. Uh, but I do have Ms. Kenny here who uh, is definitely an expert. Okay, Mr. Prusky. Thank you, uh, Andrew Prisky, District 4. Um, so I was the only member of the council to serve on the Board of Appeals, so I can kind of explain the conundrum they're in right now. Um, with the new policy, obviously, with telework, or I shouldn't say telework, but telemeetings, um, they have struggled, obviously, uh, based upon um, the rules that they have. So essentially, this bill allows them that flexibility and clarifying. It's a legal cleanup. For those of you that don't know, um, the council obviously appoints Board of Appeals and the administrative body, but we also kind of set the rules they, for, in terms of approval. So essentially, I'm sure Ms. Kenny can get through the nitty gritty, but that's the intention of this bill is to allow that flexibility. And right now, uh, not that they can't, but I'm sure there's a legal opinion that they're saying that they should get it approved by the council. So anyways, I just wanted to speak because I did speak with the legal counsel um, from the Board of Appeals to kind of sort through some of the issues they've had. But again, I'll let the law office kind of chime in but that is the purpose of, of this legislation. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kinney, would you like to speak to it? I guess here you're acting as counsel to the county executive and not to the Board of Appeals, is that right? That's correct. Okay. With that, do you wanna add anything? <laughs> um, Kelly Kenny, Supervising County Attorney. I really don't have too much to add as Mr. Prusky indicated, this will allow the Board of Appeals to go forward with virtual hearings which they have not done yet to date. So they have a backlog of cases. I think it's like 50 plus cases. So this will allow them to actually move forward and do those virtually, sets up a process for them to accept exhibits electronically ahead of time um, and sets up a process for those to be presented probably via Zoom or something similar to that um, during a virtual hearing. So it'll essentially allow them to move forward where they haven't been able to do that for the last year. Thank you. Do any of my colleagues have comments or questions? Ms. Pickard, you co-sponsored this bill. You're welcome to say something or not. Don't. Thank you, Madam Chair. Allison, <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, we just got it. We really need to get this Board of Appeals moving, and they feel very strongly that they need this uh, language change in the code to accommodate that need. So let's get it done. Thanks. Okay, I don't think any of my colleagues have any more comments or questions. My question is, can we get through a discussion of the next bill, 1421, in five minutes? <laughs> I think um, Ms. Corby, Madam Secretary, do you have an opinion? Should we start on this bill before we take our break? We're on 14. Yeah. Um, I think actually we're five minutes away from 1030, to be fair. I think we should just take the break right now and get it over with. Okay. Well, that is fine with me. Shall we, now it's 1026. Shall we come back at 1040? Short or 10 minutes would be, you know, 1036. So if you want to stay between 1036 and 1040, let's aim for that. Okay, we will. We know it takes okay. people a little bit to get back. All right, that yeah. makes sense. I'll get our recess slide up and we will okay. take a break. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? I can. I, I usually hear you better when you're on, uh, you know, earbuds than I don't have when you're not. The Is there something else I can help with? Oh, <laughs> but apparently Siri can hear you too. <laughs> oh, Siri was respond. Um, apparently, I used a trigger word when I just asked you that question. That is, I feel like this is a bit of a bizarre morning. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, on. it's discombobulated. Okay, so um, good. You can hear me. I thought I started out good, but I just got some messages from people saying that a moment ago that I was back to being muffled. So I don't know what's going on with my and. Mr. Pruski, it's kind of hard to hear you most of the time. And then somehow the audio jumped way up, but it was scratchy and then went back down. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I do have uh, tele-learning going on as well, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we have a lot of people here and everybody's doing multiple things. And I think that, that bandwidth and signals are being seriously impacted this morning, so. Not much we can do about that. We just do our best. I'll continue to speak clearly and loudly, and hopefully that'll help when I do talk. I don't really have a lot to say during a work session, but that's what I'll do. And Madam Chair, if some, somebody cannot hear me and they need to repeat me, I'd be, repeat myself, I'd be happy to do that as well. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you weren't usually happy to repeat yourself, but I'll ask, feel free to ask you. <laughs> um, uh, Ms. Lacey, I will do a quick roll for you too when we get back together here, okay? Um, okay. Roll call, I'm sorry. If you want me to, just ask me. We'll give our colleagues a couple more minutes. This is Beverly, your captioner. I'm assuming that when we're on a break like this, we're not on air. And then do you get counted down to go back on air again? We actually remain on air. Um, okay. And ultimately, the video that gets posted, I think they do edit some of this out. So it's okay what we're doing. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I don't want to memorialize all this off topic conversation. <laughs> oh, no. I don't think you need to capture this part of the conversation because it'll probably get edited out. I will make sure that it does anyway. So perfect. perfect. Thank, Thank you. you for checking. Sure. Madam Secretary, I think the gang's all here. Okay, let's do a quick roll call. Ms. Lacey? Present. Ms. Pickard? Present. Mr. Volke? Present. Mr. Pruski? Here. Ms. Fiedler? Present. Ms. Rodvian? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Rodvian is absent. I did receive a message she was unable to attend. Uh, Ms. Hare? Present. Madam Auditor, Ms. Susan Smith. Present. Uh, Madam Legislative Council, Ms. Linda Schuett. Here. Great, Madam Chair, everyone's here except for Ms. Rodvian. Thank you. Actually, most of us are present and only a couple of us are here. So with that down, <laughs> we are ready to talk about bill number 1421, which is co-sponsored by Mr. Pruski and Ms. Pickard. So whichever of you would like to go first, Mr. Pruski. Thank you, Madam Chair, Andrew Prusky, District 4. Um, for those of you that know, uh, and we're going to see this when we do the GDP or when we review the county code, there's some archaic things that you notice. Um, and through the years, uh, through my service, since we were talking about the Board of Appeals earlier and other things, sheds in Anne Arundel County. Um, so as my tenure got on, I've gotten a lot of neighbors, friends, uh, folks who live in different districts um, approach me and for those of you that don't know, uh, many sheds are in non-compliance, but nobody says anything uh, in terms of the county. But we certainly looked at various codes in our region and area. And remember when our code was written, that certain things were written based upon house size and other things. Uh, through that review, though, uh, I had the opportunity and I thought that maybe we could update our code 
and the recommendations that we worked on very closely with the administration and certainly planning and zoning uh, was to try and be um, a little more reasonable uh, in, in the code. And so the bill that you see here does two things. Uh, right now, if you have an eight by eight foot shed, uh, you would have to file beyond that, anything beyond an eight by eight, by eight foot shed, uh, obviously setbacks, whatever else you still have to abide by, you'd have to file for a permit. And what the bill does is anything under 150 square feet, still setting setbacks, whatever else you would not need a permit. Um, so let's just give an example right now. If I go to Home Depot or Lowe's and I'm buying a shed, it's very rare actually, believe it or not, to find eight by eight foot sheds. They're 10 by eight, 11 by seven. You can kind of see obviously, and of course, uh, people accumulate things and other things in other areas. And so obviously uh, that, that's one of the things for the bill. The other one uh, was the R5 section in the frontline lot. Uh, if you go into uh, my area in West County, you drive along Watchapple Road or Route 3, uh, you go into Millersville. Uh, I can go into many different communities and list them. If you look at R5 properties, many of them were built with irregular lots. They were not built by what we have in the county code of what you say about a 6,100 or 200 uh, square foot lot. That's what we're saying, you know, fits in an R5 now. Obviously, if you go into uh, sections where you're looking at, um, you know, cluster development, other things, some of the rules change, obviously, with the boundaries. But obviously, when I talk about those regular lots, if somebody's trying to put a shed on the side of their house, which a lot of people try and do in an R5, that front line, lot line can be an issue. Um, and so anyways, the, the two uh, fixes here for the bill uh, really uh, work on um, addressing uh, two of those issues. So uh, number one, 150 square feet, you still got to meet setbacks, everything else. And then the other other change is that front uh, line setback, uh, 50 to 40, if it's less than eight by eight. So hopefully I, I articulated that correctly, but that's kind of where we're at with this bill. And I hope that I get your support. Thank you so much. And thank you to the administration and planning and zoning for your willingness to work with me on this. Mr. Barron, would any one of your team like to speak to the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration, happy to. Uh, we have with us at the virtual table, Ms. Miller and Mr. Kai Ziegler from Office of Planning and Zoning, Ms. Kenny from the Office of Law, and uh, Mr. Wasim from INP. Uh, yeah, as, as the sponsor mentioned, a lot of communication and collaboration on, on crafting this bill. Uh, the administration supports. Um, I, I believe you characterized uh, the, the specifics of the bill correctly, Mr. Uh, Prusky, but I will um, ask Ms. Miller or anyone from uh, IMP or planning and zoning to to weigh in if, if it's misstated, but this is this is a pretty simple bill uh, to to facilitate um, uh, sheds and and playhouses and and all of that stuff that that we know uh, folks need and use and and are already placing in the county. So this is as as I view it, and and I think as the administration views it, much more of a, a corrective bill bringing our code into a more modern um uh, uh a more modern uh, approach to the way things are happening with these kinds of small structures and seeing no one from planning and zoning raise it up i think you did great mr brusky oh wait hold on one second we've got somebody from imp mr wasim i'm gonna ask him to to, to add a little bit to this Hello everyone, my name is Nabil. I'm Assistant Director from um, Inspections and Permits, and this is my first council session, so I apologize So, getting used to the etiquettes of this setting. <laughs> um, but uh, so just, uh, I was having a little bit of internet audio connectivity, so I, just so I understand, um, reading it, you are asking for increasing the allowable size of one-story detached structures, accessory structures, um, and are you asking only, if that is true, uh, are you asking for only residential or also commercial? Mr. Prusky. Uh, my understanding is the way this bill is written, this is residential. Uh, commercial is a whole nother, 
ball game. And like I said, this is about county residents um, trying to be able to get codes that match and make sense, uh, as Mr. Barron stated. So um, that is correct. And, and let me be clear, I, I characterize this in the vernacular as sheds. Mr. Barron, thank you for correcting me. This is accessory structures, um, which had those limits and is listed in the code as well. So thank you for doing that uh, as well. Thank you. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair, Nathan Volke, District 3. Mr. Prusky, I, uh, I like this bill because I was thinking about doing a shed myself and I was limited to the eight by eight. It's hard to find eight by eights, man. 64 square feet is tough. So 150 is a good up and I like that. Um, my question uh, is more specifically about the setback in R5 only and changing that. Is there a reason you limited it to just R5 as opposed to looking at setbacks in other places? Uh, I was curious about that. Mr. Prusky. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Volke. It, as you can probably tell with the administration and they'll go on the record, I actually looked at every every single district. Um, part of the problem though in, in Anne Arundel County, if you look at the 60s and 70s where there was that post-World War II growth, the R5 lots are really the ones that are mostly irregular. Um, again, this is my cursory view looking around uh, when you're going to Millersville. Uh, I even think there's some R5 in Arnold when I looked at the maps. So really that's kind of the area where they would need flexibility. I mean, when you look at the uh, size of, let's say, an R1 or, you know, you go into other uh, areas, there, there's really enough room for sheds. It's that R5 because when you have those setbacks, the five foot setback, the 15 corner setback, and even the 20 or 15 from, from the backyard, it really limits you. And so the way the houses were placed too, uh, for instance, in one of the communities I was looking at, uh, it's near Rundle High School, uh, when they built the irregular lots, I, I don't know how this got through with the county, um, but most of the lots have like a 35 foot front setback when it's supposed to be 40 or 50. So the only place to put a shed is on your side, as long as you got the five feet and whatever else. And, and uh, some of the residents were saying to me, well, you're telling me I have to do 50. I can't even put, you know, an eight by eight foot shed on the side of my house. So again, this is just a minor tweak. Um, you know, if, if we were to find some other things, I'd certainly support it, but this is kind of where the, the feedback that I've gotten. And when you look at the maps, um, and, and that's what's unfortunate. You know, I look at, uh, when you look at the county itself, I want to say the non-conforming use, but when these lots were built, somebody really didn't go to the, what we have it today. You know what I mean? What we're looking for that R5 lot with the square footage. So anyways, that's kind of, you know, where it came from. Ms. Rilke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Pruski, I appreciate that. Very helpful information. One other question that I had. So I know we're talking about sheds and playhouses and smaller things like that, but you also mentioned just accessory uses. Would this, I mean, are we talking about guest houses at this point that even if they were under their in or out or where it's the limit? I just want to make sure I'm clear on what we're voting on. Clear, clear me up, Mr. Prusky. Go ahead, Mr. Prusky. What, what, when we say accessory uses, again, I, I don't have it in front of me, but we're talking about sheds, playhouses, uh, uh, things that are considered accessory. Guest houses, basketball courts, swimming pools, that's a whole nother area of the code that we don't want to get into. This is really limited to those kind of shed and what we call accessory structures. So I want to be absolutely clear. This is not a guest house bill. And, and I wasn't going towards that. This is more of the, the limitations for storage and other things. So. Thank you, sir. I have a question. Oh, um, well, go ahead, Mr. Africa. Greg Africa, inspections and permits. Um, I apologize for not formally uh, introducing Mr. Nabil Wasim. He takes over from where uh, Bill Bryant uh, left off. I'm, we're, we're all glad to uh, have him. He, he, uh, we stole him from Fairfax County. Well, I'm also glad that uh, Mr. Mr. Kruski clarified that he's referring to residential applications. Uh, Mr. Wasim's concern is that when when we allow this on commercial applications, these commercial businesses have a tendency to uh, use it as a workspace and they put in lathe machines and other kind of equipment in there. So there, then that becomes a safety uh, concern. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, it's clarified this is, this is for residential uh, applications only. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Africa, and welcome, Mr. Wasim. We're very glad to have you. You are filling some big shoes, and we, we look forward to continuing to work with you from here on out. Um, I do have a question, which is 
for whoever can answer it. Um, as I read in the legislative summary, the I guess there's an international supplement to this code that we're updating that says sheds could be up to 120 square feet without a permit. And in this bill, we're proposing to take that square footage up to 150 square feet. Um, I am curious, what is the what is the thinking and sort of what are the parameters that we had to examine to make that particular decision? Mr. Africa? Uh, Greg Africa, INP. That is exactly why Mr. Wasim raised uh, the question of commercial application. Um, Ms. Lacey, the International Building Code that you refer to applies for commercial applications. So that's why um, when Mr. Wasim saw the 150, that's not consistent with the IBC, which is 120. However, the International Residential Code which is more applicable to uh, the residential setting allows uh, beyond 120, allows 150 square feet. Ah, thank you, that answers my question. Does anyone else have a question or a comment? Oh no, we're all Googling to get our sheds. <laughs> I couldn't find any eight by eights either. I'm having the same problem. Okay, well, it doesn't look like anybody has anything else to say, so we will move on to Bill 1521, and thank you to the panel for coming this morning. Madam Chair, I believe 1521 is, uh, is Councilwoman Rodby and my bill. Um, I'll be super brief, uh, Jessica Hare, District 7. This at the, the last meeting that we had, um, the bill that Councilwoman Rodbian had to reduce the fee for um, uh, registrations for the short-term rentals in Annapolis. She reduced it to 100. We briefly discussed making that a more permanent fix. Um, we went back and forth about whether to amend the bill or bring a new one. This is the new bill. All it does is reduce the fee to $100 moving forward. Um, and we both hope you will support. And I, I think actually Councilman Bolke and Councilwoman Fiedler signed on as co-sponsors also. So thank you both. That's all I got. Would the administration like to comment? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Pete Barron with the administration. Joining me is Ms. McQuaid and Ms. Kenny. Um, I'll just uh, repeat some of the comments the administration made during the emergency bill. You know, this the the fee was was calculated based on an estimate. We hadn't had a short term rental law in the county. We took our best guess and passed what I think we would all agree is a is a good bill. Uh, and then a global pandemic hit that nobody uh, saw coming, which um, radically changed the industry and um, really hurt tourism and uh, the the ability of of these which are often small small businesses or or sort of a side business of uh, many of our residents. So this this bill reduces the fee to a hundred dollars for for two years. Uh, the administration is is comfortable with this level, but I do want to flag uh, that it is something that we need to be looking at closely. We do not know. Um, what the next couple of years will bring. We do not know um, how, if this fee will be sufficient to cover the county's costs. Uh, we are hopeful it is, but I just want to sort of lay a marker down for a few years from now, we might be coming back and saying uh, to this council, you set the fee too low or you set the fee too high and, and we should just be uh, cognizant that um, this is going to be an ongoing analysis of, of what the appropriate level is to make sure taxpayers uh, aren't subsidizing this activity. Anybody have any comments? Questions? Not looking like it. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Thank you, Ms. Hare. We will go ahead and actually move to bill number 1121, the GDP, if you 
You you have the floor, Mr. Barron, once all your folks are ready. Well, we're going to have a lot of folks uh, join us, so I'm going to get started and in introducing everyone um, as as folks pop in. Um, so from the administration, um, Pete Barron, uh, we also have our, our deputy uh, CAO for land use, Ms. Lori Rhodes, from OPC, our director, Mr. Kai Ziegler, um, Ms. Carrier, Mr. Stringer, Ms. Pompa, from ACDS, uh, Ms. Koch, from transportation, Ms. Urzu McIntosh, from law, Ms. Blair Klasmeyer and Ms. Kenny. Uh, we have a couple of folks waiting in the wings uh, if, if there are specific questions. Uh, this is a, a big, big deal. The, the administration is very excited to bring bill number 11-21, um, the county's general development plan, or as we call it, plan 20 forward, 2040 forward to this council um, to be uh, sort of set the table here, and then and I'm going to have some other folks uh, speak to it. Um, the, the state of Maryland requires the county to update its general development plan every 10 years. Uh, Anne Arundel County residents came together and, and created a vision for the future of our county. And as you know, uh, it, it turns out that regardless of our political affiliations, uh, um, we agree on a lot even though what we hear in the news and, and in our current political state, um, there is a ton of common ground. Uh, we want to preserve our natural resources. We want to improve our infrastructure, our quality of life, preserve and enhance existing and established neighborhoods and redevelop uh, uh, to improve the lives of, of all our neighbors and in ways that, that make this place truly the best place for all. Um, we, we also want a government that is accountable to its residents, that establishes performance metric, metrics and is transparent about the, the progress and the process and, and everything that goes into um, land use. And as Ms. Rhodes often reminds me, land use um, touches everything that county government does. Everything flows from land use. And um, Plan 2040 shows us how, how to get there. It identifies goals, policies, strategies uh, with responsible doc departments, it establishes timeframes and performance measures. It establishes nine community-led regional plans that must take place before any comprehensive rezoning is allowed. And 20 in Plan 2040, it wasn't written in a stuffy office or in a back room. It was a community-driven effort. When County Executive Pittman came into office, he hit the reset button on on the previous administration's um, big money developer interest-driven planning process and brought many many community members into the process. Then in in early 2020. Uh, we were we were struck with a global pandemic that changed everything. And just like this council, planning and zoning, county agencies, our boards, and, and the public adjusted and adapted, creating online open houses, moving meetings virtual, and, and all of us learning our favorite new word, Zoom. Um, over the last three years, a citizens advisory committee and more than 4,000 stakeholders more than 50 public meetings has helped shape and refine this plan, which is now in the council's hand. It is a large document and it demands a thorough review by this body. And before I turn it over uh, to Ms. Rhodes, I wanna reiterate that the administration stands ready to answer any questions you may have about the development of this plan, the details of the plan, the process for implementation, the steps that come after plan 2020 or plan 2040 is adopted. Uh, we are sure this will take several meetings uh, for you to hear from the public, the interest groups and the experts. We, we look forward to your review, stand ready to assist and are certain 
that the work of this council will make this plan even better. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Rhodes to give you a sort of a 30,000 foot overview of plan 2040 after Ms. Rhodes. She will turn it over to our planning and zoning director, uh, Mr. Kai Ziegler, who will hand it over to the subject matter experts at PNZ for some brief remarks. So with that, um, Ms. Rhodes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pete Barron. Good morning, council chair and members of the council. My name is Lori Rhodes. I'm the deputy chief administrative officer for land use. We know you understand, but for the benefit of the public watching, I wanna talk about what this document is and what it is not, what it does and what is left to do. Volume one of plan 2040 addresses opportunities and challenges and sets goals and policies in four primary chapters, the natural environment, the built environment, healthy communities and healthy economy. It also provides the plan land use map, a plan for implementation and accountability and a measurement and monitoring plan. Finally, it lays out the framework for the region planning process that will follow the adoption of the plan. Volume two of the plan provides detailed background information on existing conditions and trends that inform the plan, as well as the full concurrency management plan. With 600 goals, policies, and strategies in plan 2040 and nine region plans to prepare, the county's work program is full if we wanna realize the vision of the plan. While the plan is not regulatory in nature, a significant number of code changes must be made to achieve the vision. The rational planning process that will culminate the final draft before you today as Bill 11-21 essentially subsumes data gathering and analysis, significant stakeholder participation, setting of plan policies, plan implementation, and reevaluation. We have a lot of work to do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Kai Ziegler who will provide you with more input. Well, thank you, Lori Rhodes and Pete Barron. I appreciate your starting comments. I'm Steve Kai Ziegler. I'm the planning and zoning officer for the county. Good morning, Chairman Lacey and members of the County Council. As Mr. Barron has indicated, over the last three years of work and refinement has gone into the, the final draft for plan 2040. In their November 2020 comments, the Maryland Department of Planning noted that Plan 2040 successfully approaches the visions of the county in a holistic manner. MDP called the plan user-friendly and praised the contemporary plan style, suggesting the format could be a model for other jurisdictions throughout the states. I tend to agree. In my 33-year career, this is the best general development plan or comprehensive plan that I've had the pleasure of working on. We believe that we've struck a balance between competing interests and priorities. We're extremely pleased to be entering the legislative process and look forward to working with the County Council on this plan. We have a short presentation for you by the planning team and then we are happy to answer any of your questions. Cindy Carrier, the planning administrator overseeing the long range planning section will start the presentation, cover the history of planning and growth management in the county, as well as in the planning process for plan 2040. Michael Stringer, a county senior planner in the long range planning section, will give an overview of the plan and discuss some of the comments that have resulted in key revisions to the draft plan. Christina Pampa, our deputy planning and zoning officer for the planning division, will discuss the plan use land use map, implementation, and the region plans. I'd also like um, you to know that we have several other folks with us today. Martha McIntosh from the Office of Transportation, Al Herb from the Health Department, and Kathleen Koch, Executive Director of ACDS, to answer questions after our presentation. I should note, this is truly a comprehensive document that involves the public, innumerable departments within the county structure, state agencies, um, and, and we want to make sure that we have as many of the folks available to answer any of your questions as we can today. If there's any questions we can't answer today, we'll provide answers as, shoot, as soon as we can. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Cindy Carrier to start our formal presentation. Thank you, um, Mr. Kai Ziegler. Good morning, Chair Lacey and members of the County Council. For the record, I'm Cindy Carrier and I'm the Planning Administrator of the Long Range Planning Section in the Office of Planning and Zoning. 
and have been the primary project manager for Plan 2040 for the last three and a half years. Um, Ms. Corby, could you yeah, upload our slideshow? Thank you. Um, and turn it to the next slide. And then this. So um, we'll give you a brief history today and go over the process and an overview of a summary of the comments of Plan 2040, um, go over the plan land use map and implementation of the plan. Can I have the next slide, please. So one of the primary functions of the county's GDP is to guide growth and development in the county. Input that we received during this process gave us insight that a lot of residents were unaware that we have an existing growth management program. The first growth management program in the county was developed as an interim ordinance passed by the county council in 1977. The interim ordinance focused on adequate public facilities and then was further developed with five elements with the adoption of the 1978 GDP. The existing program we have today consists of six elements shown in this slide. The general development plan is at the center of the growth management program by setting the policy framework for guiding growth and development patterns in the county. The other five elements work together to implement the GDP and ensure that growth is guided in an orderly manner. These include the master plans, the functional master plans like water and sewer master plan provides more technical detail, and the geographic master plan such as the town center plans, previous small area plans, and the upcoming region plans will provide more detail at the community level. GDP growth policies are implemented through requirements in the zoning, subdivision, development, floodplain, building, and construction codes. The adequate public facilities ordinance ensures capacity is available to meet the needs of new development. Management systems are in place to measure the impact of new development and future growth patterns and to provide continuous monitoring of such things as public costs and revenues and water and wastewater flows. Finally, the growth management program has a capital facilities and improvement program that provides public investments to our communities based on needs identified in the GDP and or our community plans. Can I have the next slide, please? So the county's first GDP was developed in 1968 and has been updated four times in 1978, 1986, 1997, and 2009. This slide shows a map of the 1968 land use map with the public sewer service area depicted in yellow and the 1978 land use map with the public sewer service area in blue. In the 1968 map, the area to the of the yellow boundary is what was considered the county's growth area and represents 86% of its land. The 1978 GDP updated, update evaluated several land use alternatives and chose one that encouraged most new growth in and near developed areas. This contained pattern of growth is depicted as everything east of the blue boundary and represents 58% of the county's land. The county has maintained this contained pattern of growth in and near its developed areas through the updates of the 1986, 1997, and 2009 GDPs. Through continued use of the growth management program, the area is now reduced to 50% of the land area. As our county is now nearly built out within this defined growth area, Plan 2040 recommends continuing with this development envelope through redevelopment reinvesting in our existing communities and preserving our rural and agricultural areas. Could I have the next slide, please? So just to quickly go over a comprehensive planning process. In general, it involves three major phases. The plan development phase, which we are currently in the process of. Uh, implementation, which will immediately follow the adoption of this plan and measurement, which will continue between implement, implementation and the next time that an update is due, will assess how well the recommendations that are adopted in the GDP are achieving the vision and goals of the plan. 
So this slide shows the plan development phase, which has included public engagement at each step. Drafting the county's GDP is a collaborative effort, as mentioned before, and involves the input of most of the county's agencies. The city of Annapolis, adjacent jurisdictions, county residents, and other stakeholder groups. The first step in plan development gauge where we are now, and as mentioned before, involve lots of public input through listening sessions and online surveys. The second step, define where and what do we want to be. Excuse me. With community visioning meetings, online surveys, and citizen advisory committee input, a vision, vision themes, and goals were developed. The third step involved defining how do we want to get to where we want to be. With community input through an online open house and citizen advisory committee input, policies and strategies were developed to produce a preliminary draft. The preliminary draft was reviewed and revised based on community input and a draft for planning board review was prepared. Again, community input was received during the planning board review and additional revisions were made to prepare this final draft that is before you for adoption. Plan 2040 is greener, smarter, and more equitable. It recommends an overhaul of the growth management program, reinstates the community planning process, and makes a commitment to follow adoption of it with implementation and measurement. It not only meets the state's requirement, but provides a balanced approach to guiding growth and development in the county to meet the diverse range of our residents' needs. So I will now turn the presentation over to Michael Stringer to brief you on the process, overview the plan, and the summary of the revisions that have been made. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Next slide, please. And, and thank you, Madam Chair and Honorable Council members. Um, this is my first time presenting in front of you, so I'd like to just take one brief moment to uh, introduce myself. Um, I am a, uh, grew up in, in uh, Interval County, went to public schools here before going on to uh, college and getting my graduate degree from the University of Maryland. And um, after spending the last 15 years of my career working in community planning and environmental planning in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, um, happy and honored to have returned back and had this opportunity to work for the county um, in trying to um, help create this, this amazing plan you see before you. Um, so, as, as Mr. Barron and, and uh, Ms. Carriers mentioned, here's a list of the extensive community engagement that was the real foundation of the planning process. As was mentioned, um, we had, uh, first of all, a citizen advisory committee, 23 members dedicated innumerable hours uh, to this process, met over 28 times um, between 2019 and 2020 to help really formulate and get into the details of what this plan should look like. There was much broader community engagement through the visioning and listening sessions. We had target engagement to, uh, to youth, especially through the support of Arundel High School and, and their programs. Um, and when the pandemic hit, as Mr. Barron said, we went online um, and we developed an online open house where we were able to present the draft goals um, as well as the, the land use map for uh, the public to comment on through the safety and comfort of their homes. And um, finally, through the when we got to the point of having the draft plan, we put that out for public review for uh, 45 days in uh, in September through November, and uh, received about 470 um, individuals and organizations submitting comments on that. And then through the planning advisory board, also another public comment period on a revised draft of the plan. And I think the council members have all had the opportunity to review some of these iterative drafts, materials that have gone out. So what we'd really like to focus my discussion on today is kind of what we've heard from the community and how we've refined the plan to address their concerns. So next slide, please. Can we go back one? There we go. This one, yes, thank you. Um, this word cloud depicts some of the key ideas that we heard through the very beginning of the process, through these visioning and listening sessions about what were the community's concerns? What were they, what did they perceive as challenges and opportunities for the county? And these big picture themes we heard throughout the planning process, throughout the comments we received through uh, draft versions of the plan. Top on the, on the list were, you know, the amount and pace of development. We've heard uh, concerns that population growth and development is changing the character and quality of life of the county. We've heard a lot about traffic congestion, um, concerns that it's, it's taking too long or spending too much time in our cars trying to get from point A to point B. 
Um, concerns that our infrastructure and school capacities are not keeping up with, uh, with development and growth. Concerns about the, the quality and the environment of the county that has been declining over time. Um, and interest in, in parks and public water access. We also heard a lot of optimism and excitement about opportunities for the county, about really focusing on redevelopment and revitalization. As we look around and see the strip malls and other commercial centers that um, even before the pandemic were, uh, were sitting vacant or with low uh, occupancy rates, seeing opportunities for those to be places that we can revitalize to help encourage community and economic development while also protecting our natural areas and rural areas. We see excitement and, and enthusiasm for infrastructure investments. Uh, with a special focus, of course, on transportation. Um, a lot of interest in uh, investments that are going to support multimodal transportation, ability to be able to use transit to be able to walk and bike to where we want to go. Um, we also see a lot of concern from our neighborhoods about making sure that we're limiting development and protecting our mature uh, established neighborhoods, as well as um, the peninsulas, making sure that we're taking into consideration the environmental and infrastructure constraints of those special areas. We've heard strong commitment for the continuing um, a dedication for the county to protect its agricultural and rural areas. And um, for the first time really articulated clearly in this plan uh, for the county in terms of general development plan, our strong statements on social and racial equity to make sure that we are reflecting back on how our public uh, policies, especially related to land use and housing, have um, exacerbated inequalities in the county and to make sure that we are thinking proactively about how we address and mitigate those issues. Next slide, please. Plan 2040 has these fundamental elements of it. We have the vision and themes. There are two, there are a lot of maps in the, uh, in the document, but I'll point out two in particular, the development, development policy areas map and the planned land use map. These really illustrate where we want different types of development to go. We then have our goals, policies, and strategies that are focused on four categories. And this seems a little bit different from past general development plans and typical comprehensive plans that usually are focused on, say, a housing element of transportation. This model is built on recommendations from the American Planning Association um, of how to integrate sustainable development into local comprehensive plans. So by taking these categories of natural environment, built environment, healthy community, and healthy economy, we're trying to break down some of the silos of old plans and highlight the connections um, between these different areas. As was mentioned, this plan also includes an implementation um, section, which has been very important and has taken a lot of consideration of county staff to think through how do we hold ourselves accountable? How do we be able to demonstrate to the community progress? How do we set up metrics that we can benchmark our, our efforts and progress on? So next slide, please. So I'd like to walk through some of these key elements, again, with a focus on how they've been revised and refined. Um, the vision themes, Mr. Barron uh, paraphrased these earlier that we want to have a resilient, environmentally sound, and sustainable communities. And this language, I should credit, um, comes primarily from the discussions of the Citizen Advisory Committee, with staff helping revise and refine the language. And uh, inspired by the discussions from the community in those visioning and listening sessions. Um, new and improved infrastructure, again, with a focus uh, particularly on thinking about transportation, how we kind of envision transportation for the 21st century, how we improve our, uh, our stormwater management, our water and sewer, um, and thinking through um, also our broadband and kind of the new technology infrastructure. Um, strategic economic growth and redevelopment, knowing that that is a, a core to a healthy and vibrant community. A lot of thought about community character. Um, how do we try to um, protect what is great, what people love about their current neighborhoods while also allowing for development and improvement? And finally, inclusive, equitable, and responsive government. And you've seen a, a strong commitment um, through this planning process to make sure that we are being transparent, that we are giving the community opportunities to be able to um, have say in what they want to see in these plans, and that we're creating structures that way in the future, they continue to be engaged in implementation and helping us hold us accountable. Next slide, please. So these vision themes are achieved through the set of interrelated goals, policies, and strategies. And as I mentioned, I want to highlight how we've refined the goals and policies and strategies through the public process. These first were made available through that summer online open house. And in that process, we allowed the community to review the draft uh, language of the goals, policies, and strategies and ask them to rate them, uh, the goals, on a scale of one to five. Um, and 
across the board got very high positive ratings on the goals, which I think shows that we had uh, adequately reflected what the community had been telling us through those previous uh, element, through previous pieces of the, of the planning process. And as we moved into actually giving the draft full draft plan out for the review in the fall and then review by the planning advisory board, um, we continued to refine and edit those. And I think the suggestions got from the community became more and more refined as well. So I, I feel like we set good direction that was confirmed through those processes and that what we're seeing in these edits are real refinements uh, and improvements to those goals, policies, and strategies. After that preliminary draft was put out for public review in the fall, we made 159 individual edits to the document um, that then went to the planning advisory board. And after the planning advisory board's review and the public comments submitted there, we made an additional 50 edits into the document that then um, went into the, the county council for your consideration. Um, next slide, please. Before we get into specific edits um, to the document and changes, I want to give kind of an overview context of what are we hearing back from the community as it's gone out for these review processes. And the, the table on this slide, the next kind of um, list some of those key topics and provide numbers of times um, that these were mentioned in comments and feedback from community. The prelim comment there, column there is the preliminary draft that was out in the fall. The PAB is the planning advisory board um, review of, of their version of the document. And you'll see that the numbers kind of drop off there for the PAB side. Um, that reflects a few things. Um, and one of them in particular is that as we get to the planning advisory board, the, the commenting becomes more formal. So instead of a lot of individuals submitting comments, it tends to be more community associations submitting comments on behalf of their membership. But going to the topic sides, um, we heard a lot about environmental protection and a lot of broad support for the strength of the natural environment goals and policies that are in the plan. We also heard some concerns from folks, particularly in the real estate and business area, that maybe these predictions have gotten too strong in the plan 2040. Transportation and traffic uh, is always one of the biggest comments we hear when we talk to the public, and it was certainly true here as well. Um, a lot of interest in public transit and making investments in that to make sure that that's a viable, reliable option for folks. And um, a lot of interest, particularly in the, uh, the Maryland Route 3 corridor between uh, Crofton, Gambrels, Millersville, especially, of concerns about the development uh, that has happened there in recent years and the congestion that's, that's followed. Also related to transportation, a lot of comments about pedestrian infrastructure and walkability, bike infrastructure, a lot of um, uh, comments, a lot of the communities telling us that they want to see, that they appreciate the investments the county is making in that space and want to see more of that. Um, on the infrastructure side, um, we receive a lot of comments um, asking the county to make sure that we are adequately providing infrastructure prior to development um, and strengthening our adequate public facilities regulations or looking for other ways that we can help make sure that the infrastructure is in place to support development. And in a, in a similar vein is on that capacity issue with schools. And of course, we hear a lot about this um, uh, through, through, through county council and through the Board of Education, a lot of concerns about the capacity of our schools, the quality of our education. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Some other topics that also come up, um, retail and commercial development. We see a high number here in the, in the preliminary draft uh, for comments on this space. This is largely related to comments on individual um, properties where there were applications submitted proposing to, uh, to change the land use classification. Um, and broadly, the comments are often concerns from community members about, do we have too much commercial and retail development? And especially this concern has been heightened through the pandemic um, as we see vacancy rates um, in, in that space. Um, caps on building permits. This has been a, a topic that we've heard from some advocacy groups in the county thinking about, are there other innovative tools the county can be using to, to manage growth? And we added a section in, uh, in Plan 2040 on page uh, 34 to address this question of this. Um, racial and social equity. Uh, we heard a number of comments about this, especially as it relates and gets associated with affordable housing. Um, strong connection being made in some of these public comments around that being a key leverage point to making sure that uh, community of all uh, people of all colors, of all income levels, can have more access to opportunity if they can afford to live in different parts of the county. And these last three at the bottom are end up becoming interrelated comments around the peninsulas, specifically around uh, Mayo Peninsula, and then public water access. So we've heard from some very organized and, and 
um, effective community organizations, real interest in trying to push for increasing protections uh, and limiting development on the peninsulas. Um, and interestingly, there's a bit of a tension with that with the community of, of people who are interested in increasing public water access and concerns that by putting increased restrictions on development peninsulas, we may be also constraining the ability for the public to access the water in those places. So there's tensions in the county that we're trying to find balance and common ground on throughout this plan. Slide, please. So getting into some of the specific areas, I want to highlight just a couple of different goals or policies or strategies that we revised um, in, the, in, in this version that went from the Planning Advisory Board to the County Council draft. Um, and we'll, we'll take a couple examples from each of the major sections, the natural, build, um, communities, and economy sections. On the natural environment, um, we've heard concerns about our critical areas regulations. So we've um, strengthened our policies around that to make sure that we are um, um, looking at habitat protections for threatened and endangered species within that. And that's a process that is, is underway right now. We've heard a lot of comments about stormwater and water quality. Um, and also comments concerned about basing regulations on climate change forecasts. Um, so we've clarified in the plan that as we look at stormwater management requirements, we think they do need to be updated for uh, the latest precipitation data, which we see has been changing in last, you know, re in recent years compared to the distant past, uh, as we're seeing higher intensity rain events. Um, water quality in ag, um, it was pointed out that um, a lot of our water quality and stormwater uh, language in Plan 2040 was focused on the construction on development and that agriculture wasn't included in there. So we made sure to uh, to get to point that out that, that is a major contributing source of water pollution to the Chesapeake Bay. And then also that we have uh, county programs that we're supporting in Plan 2040, especially through the Soil Conservation District, to work with agricultural operations to control sediment runoff and water quality impacts. In the Jabez branch, um, one of the special areas in the county with uh, with great habitat quality when we're investing in restoration projects. It was noted in one of the virtual town halls um, that there had previously been uh, discussed and drafted an overlay zone for the Jabez branch. So based on that comment, we looked back and did our research and included a strategy within Plan 2040 to bring back that overlay to review it and see if that's something we could refine and adopt. Slide, please. Pivoting over to the built environment. Um, again, consistent with what we've heard earlier, one of the biggest comments we hear about is transportation. Um, the Anne Arundel Transportation Commission, Maryland Department of Planning, Department of Transportation, the Planning Advisory Board, and many community members gave us comments around transportation and the plan and really helped push us to better articulate through the plan how we connect and intersect land use and transportation, knowing that these two are deeply related and how how we approach one dramatically affects the other. So we've put in language to clarify that Plan 2040 incorporates uh, Move Van Rundle, which was uh, adopted by the County Council in November 2019. Now the language, if you look at the two documents side by side, is slightly different because the framework of goals, policies, and strategies, kind of how we wrote the language and structured it within the document in Plan 2040 is slightly different than how that language was organized in Move Van Rundle. So, some of the ideas, the words might be slightly different, but the content of Move and Rundle is uh, incorporated into the plan, uh, most specifically underneath the goal uh, built environment 15, but also integrated throughout the document, including the performance measures from Move and Rundle. Um, relative to town centers and some of these other uh, specific geographies of the county, um, we were requested and, and we have made changes to make sure that we're emphasizing the multimodal access to these places. So in town centers, we really want people to be able to um, live, work, play, learn, all in uh, close proximity. We've emphasized in that goal language that we want to be able to do those things without reliance on a, a daily use of a car. For critical economic areas, those major employment areas of the county, we've added in text to make sure that we are thinking about making those more transit accessible, that as we're uh, designing and, uh, and reviewing projects that get permitted in those areas, that we're thinking about transit-friendly design. Um, critical corridors, um, this is reflecting on some of those areas like Route 3 and Route 2 throughout the county that we highlight in the plan as being areas that need special attention, especially at this nexus of land use and transportation. Um, based on a comment from those communities, 
um, we've refined um, those policies to really focus on improving mobility and safety. And importantly, we've removed the critical corridors from being what we initially had proposed as one of our targeted areas for development and redevelopment um, at the request of those community members who want to see, uh, especially in that Route 3 corridor, who are really pushing to say, we need to pause and slow growth in these areas and figure out these solutions before we, um, before we are, are promoting more growth. And that's an area, of course, that we've received tension on the Planning Advisory Board. Uh, there were some, a lot of discussion from uh, different constituents um, about how to approach that issue and whether we should be um, trying to promote or hold back development in that, in that particular area. Next slide, please. Regarding affordable housing, um, this is something that the, P the Planning Advisory Board in particular heard testimony on um, the need for affordable workforce housing and providing a range of housing densities in the county um, and making sure that we're not concentrating uh, poverty, but rather allowing more access to opportunities throughout the county. The Planning Advisory Board recommended the county strongly support affordable housing, that we strengthen the goals and policies and strategies that were in the plan to make sure that affordable housing efforts are coordinated, especially with land use, environmental and infrastructure. So through, that, through those recommendations of the Planning Advisory Board, we strengthened the recommendations that the county should implement a moderately priced dwelling unit program. Uh, this is a, a, a program that's been adopted in several other counties around us, like Montgomery and Howard, where when significant size developments come in, they're required to set aside a portion of the units to be affordable. We've also clarified language on accessory dwelling units. So uh, different from the accessory structures, this is where we do talk about the mother-in-law suites, the uh, you know, type of small uh, in-law suites that can be built um, with a residential structure designed for occupancy. Um, and we've also uh, emphasized that we need some coordinations and inter interagency work group within the county to make sure that the different parts of the county are working together to move this forward because you can often find that your intention or conflict between the needs of different departments and different regulatory mandates um, when looking at, at affordable housing. Slide please. Um, also in the built environment section, the Planning Advisory Board wanted to see us strengthen our language on, on climate change and sea level rise. We have a, a suite of about 16 strategies in the plan related to climate change. Um, there's a specific goal, um, goal of the built environment 16 that is focused on climate change and sea level rise. It's also integrated into a number of other areas of the plan, including around um, our infrastructure, our transportation systems, um, and our land use. So we added some more information to really kind of help tie those things together in the plan to be able to clearly show where those pieces connect and bring that issue more to the fore. Now, staff's perspective is that there is much more work to be done on this issue. There are some great things underway, like we heard about the, the solar on the Glen Burnie landfill. There are great actions we can take right now. There's also need for, uh, for more planning, more uh, uh, coordination around this effort. So Plan 2040 sets up a policy framework, but there's going to be lots of work to do to implement in that regard. Slide, please. Um, a couple more topics for, for the built environment before we transition. Um, the need to promote redevelopment revitalization. This is the flip side of the coin for our, for our growth management, that we want to be able to promote revitaliz revitalization and redevelopment in key areas while we're protecting those um, rural and environmental areas. We got some constructive comments from folks in the real estate industry asking to make sure that we are uh, clearly articulating that we need to you know, streamline our review process for these areas that we've identified um, for where we want to have targeted development and redevelopment. And that we're looking at regulatory tools like was recently adopted for Glen Burnie to think about how we can improve our, um, our regulations to make sure that we're making that redevelopment, what we want to see happen, the easier thing to happen. Um, so there's a number of policies listed on this slide that have been refined uh, through, the, through the review process to make sure that we're strengthening and clarifying expectations for that. And of course, there'll be much more work to do as that actually becomes proposed changes to county code that'll be discussed in much more detail when those type, when the actual code reform efforts um, come forward after this plan is adopted. Next slide, please. One more thing for the built environment, uh, I want to talk about growth tiers. I mentioned there's a lot of maps that talk about how and where we grow in the county. Uh, the growth tiers map is, is one that's based on Maryland state law. And they require that we map out and designate the areas that 
and define these primarily based on where there is uh, planned sewer service. And through comments from the Maryland Department of Planning and also comments from some community groups, we've added a, a category. We've typically talked about this as four growth tiers, um, numbered as uh, and named as growth tiers one, two, three, and four. Um, and one and two is where we have existing or, or planned sewer service. And what we did here is by adding a 1A and a 2A is distinguishing between where there is the public sewer service and where there is these targeted areas that we wanna see growth. So for example, we were hearing some concerns from some communities saying, hey, um, let's take the, the Mayo Peninsula, for example, of that we have sewer service there, but we don't want to be, you know, we don't wanna be parole. We don't wanna be a, a, a area for um, higher intensity development. So as by establishing this 1A and 2A, this kind of allows us to make that distinction of clearly calling out um, through areas one and two, those areas that we um, want to see as targeted development areas. So our town centers, our, our key employment centers, uh, some of our, our smaller village centers where we have um, existing commercial or, or um, uh, commercial uses within our residential areas, that those areas that we want to see that focused redevelopment revitalization, but that we also have these areas that are served by public sewer. So we're trying to reconcile, make sure that there's clarity between that development policy area where we want to see growth targeted and also this state requirement where we map these growth areas. Okay, slide please. Okay, now pivoting to healthy communities. Um, this is an area that as uh, we've received a lot of positive comments on the on the goals and policies for this area and a couple areas for improvement um, based around school capacity and public water access. I wanted to mention those in particular. Um, the Planning Advisory Board had a lot of discussion around school capacity and we received a lot of comments around this. Um, and Plan 2040 recognizes the importance of high quality education and the challenges of balancing school capacity and student enrollment. And the, the the Anne Arundel County Public Schools and Office of Planning Zoning have coordinated on preparation of Plan 2040 and the goals and policies related to schools in that. Uh, Healthy Communities Goal HC2, um, and it's supporting policies and strategies address school capacity. The goal relates to improving the existing tools uh, that we use to manage school capacity. Um, that includes our adequate public facilities ordinance, um, includes tools like um, redistricting. Um, and as we, as well as prioritizing our capital investments to reduce the achievement gap, as we discussed earlier in the uh, in the council work session, to make sure that we're all working towards those goals. So, Plan Twenty Forty um, includes efforts to make sure that we are looking at the adequate public facilities ordinance and looking at ways that we can be innovative with how it's applied. Montgomery County recently went through an effort to update their adequate public facilities regulations, and looking at some new models of how we evaluate and how we how we finance um, these improvements. So we'll be looking at a model similar to that to kick off and, and see if we can help improve things. Public water access was another topic that we got a number of comments on. Um, I wanted to kind of explain this one for council members and, and to the public who may be watching that um, we received a lot of comments from organized groups and, and community members who have been advocating and pushing for public water access. And this is a high priority for the county and you, you see the county making investments and improvements um, to increase public water access. Um, public water access is included in Plan 2040 underneath the Healthy Communities Goal 8 and is supporting policies and implementing strategies. They recommend increasing park and recreation opportunities. We have specific references to public water access in, in challenges and opportunities listed in the document on in volume one on page 57 um, and in volume two as well um, more details on public water access on page 196 there. Now we didn't create a specific goal or policy for public water access as some of the advocates were asking us for and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that we have a separate plan the uh, the land preservation parks and recreation plan that actually is, is uh, Currently, the, par the Recreation and Parks Department is in the process of updating that. And that is a plan where we have where we have the space where we talk about prioritization of park investments. And we also make sure that we are in Plan 2040 um, creating parity across the different recreation facilities. We were concerned that if we create a specific goal for public water access, then you know, we'd hire uh, requests the next week for goals for um, more ball fields or pickleball courts. Um, and those those competing interests of different types of recreation facilities um, gets more properly uh, considered 
as priorities within the land preservation parks and recreation plan. So at the policy level, um, the public water access is integrated in the plan. It clearly is being uh, implemented as a priority through the operations and budget, capital budget of the county, um, but we decided not to give it its own special goal and policy to keep it on, on, on equal footing with the rest of the recreational facilities in the county. Um, next slide, please. Healthy economy. Um, this is a section that we made uh, some refinements to based on comments from the public, as well as from um, some members of, of the business community like the Chamber of Commerce. Um, early on, we heard comments about the planning process and COVID. And this is a place that we uh, directly addressed COVID within the plan document of making sure that we included as one of the top priorities for policies the, the, to support the uh, Economic Development Corporation and other county operations in making sure that we have strategies that we're implementing for COVID recovery. And this is kind of to underscore work that's already underway, but make sure that we're identifying that as an important priority. We also heard some comments from um, folks in the maritime industry to make sure that they were getting enough emphasis in the plan. Uh, we do have um, uh, a number of uh, policies and strategies in the plan related to maritime, specifically in the healthy economy section under policy 2.6. It also gets referenced in the built environment section as we talk about peninsulas to make sure that we are supporting land use to help support those, those marinas around the county. We've added some more information about the, uh, the, the size, the magnitude, the scale, and the economic impact of the maritime industry in the county to the document um, in response to comments we heard from the community. And as I mentioned before, um, with the idea of, of employment centers and transit access, We've added language relative to that in both the built environment and healthy economy sections of the plan to make sure that we're thinking about accessibility to our employment centers through transit. And um, with that, I'd, I'd like to pass on uh, the, the baton here to Christina Pompa to talk about the land use plan. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, Chair Lacey and members of the County Council. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, we're certainly happy to have Plan 2040 uh, entering the legislative process, and we're excited to be working with you on any questions that you may have. Uh, I'm going to try and be brief because I know our presentation has gone a little bit longer than we intended. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with the planned land use map, which is a key portion of Plan 2040. It, as well as the corresponding goals, policies, and strategies serve as the land use plan for 20, Plan 2040. Um, Ms. Rhodes indicated very early in our presentation that the GDP is not a regulatory document. The planned land use map will inform zoning, which is regulatory. And <clears throat> you can see that the planned land use map is broken out into large categories like conservation, open space, multiple categories of residential, commercial, um, mixed use, town center, industrial, maritime, etc. Uh, how do we get to the planned land use map? Next slide, please. So one of the key things that informs the planned land use map is our development policy areas map. Um, it's an intentional and strategic approach to address what we heard over and over again from stakeholders to limit development in rural neighborhood and peninsula areas to facilitate redevelopment in targeted development, redevelopment and revitalization areas and to reform county code to reduce inconsistencies, limit modifications, and promote redevelopment. You can read more about the planned land use map in both volume one and volume two. Next slide, please. So how did we arrive at the land use, the planned land use map that's before you today? Um, page 115 in volume two of plan 2040 sets out narrative about the criteria that planning staff used in determining changes from the, the 2009 land use map to what's proposed today. The very first piece of the criteria is that is whether or not the request is consistent with the development policy area that had been established. 
Um, the criteria also addresses things like consistency with the existing use of the property, consistency with current zoning, compatibility with surrounding planned land use, consistency with defined sewer service areas, consistency with what the vision is that's laid out by Plan 2040, consistency with prior land use and zoning decisions made by the county, uh, public benefit and com community support or concern. I think as you dive into the planned land use map, one of the things that you're gonna have to take into consideration is the fact that there are many areas where a single property owner has asked for a change in, the, in land use, but they're asking for, let's say, commercial that's surrounded by a significant area of low density residential. Those are gonna require a lot of scrutiny because one change in land use now can have a great domino effect over the next 20 years as the character of that neighborhood changes. Next slide, please. Um, this is something that I brought up with the Planning Advisory Board, and I, I think it's good to talk about. Um, there, there's a unique numbering system that we used for the planned land use um, map revisions. For those people who apply during our open application period in the fall of 2019, those were our original applications. They're called land use change applications or LUCAs. We also had people apply during the online open house, during the preliminary draft plan, and the planning advisory board. They all have uh, acronyms that are similar to whatever that open comment period was, whether it's uh, OOHR, -O -O, I'm sorry, O O H R, P D R, or P A B R. And then finally, there are staff recommended land use changes, which are a result of staff's review of the planned land use map. Um, it isn't my intention to talk about any of the particular land use change applications today. Uh, we know you're going to have questions about them uh, and we'd like to reserve that for another work session. Next slide, please. Moving on to implementation, obviously implementation for Plan 2040 is going to be extremely important. The plan includes over 600 goals, policies, and strategies. And if we don't implement the recommendations, we'll never achieve the vision of the plan. One of the things that Plan 2040 lays out is the need for an implementation advisory committee that would have diverse representation and facilitate the implementation of the goals, policies, and strategies contained in the plan. There would also be annual and four-year reports on progress. And you can read more about that on pages 72 and 73 in volume one. But one of the biggest pieces of implement implementation that will come out of plan 2040 are the region plans. So I'd like to go to the next slide. Uh, you can read a summary about the region plans on pages 68 through 71 in volume one, and you can read full information about the region plans on pages 225 and two through 231 in volume two. And I bring that up because pagination has changed with each volume we have created. For instance, you heard Michael talk about the fact that we added two pages related to um, climate change and sea level rise. So if you think that the region plan pages are on the same place they were in the preliminary draft, they're not, but the information is still contained in the plan. So what the plan envisions is nine region plans that will be prepared to provide more detailed guidance for development in different areas of the county. The region plans will align with the goals and policies of plan 2040 and build on the small area plans that were prepared between 1998 to 2004. The content of each region plan is intended to be similar to the GDP, including a planned land use map. If the planned land use map for any region plan is inconsistent with plan 2040's planned land use map, then plan 2040 will need to be amended. This is a key point because a lot of people have asked us about whether or not there will be changes to, to the planned land use maps in the region plans and they believe that 
those plans can't change once 2040 is set in stone, and that's not true. Um, we, we have certainly made recommendations for many land use changes to be pushed off to the region plans because we think that that's the appropriate place to evaluate those where there's a more detailed effort for a smaller reg regional area. Um, so we do envision that the land use map is going to change during the region plan process. Also, uh, comprehensive zoning will take place as part of each region plan process. Similar to the land use change application process that was conducted for plan 2040 uh, during the fall of 2019, there will be a period of time during each region plan where landowners can formally apply for a zoning change. Staff will also review the zoning map for each region plan and make recommendations for zoning changes. Each of these plans will have a citizen advisory committee consisting of at least nine members with diverse composition. And after adoption, each region plan will have an implementation action committee to facilitate implementation. And details about these two committees can be found on page 71 in volume one of plan 2040. So let's talk a little bit about the schedule of the region plans. Presently, we have enough staff in the long range planning section to complete three region plans at a time. We anticipate that each plan will take between 18 to 36 months to complete. According to County Code Section 18-2103 D2, little i, little i, any general development plan adopted after July 1, 2018 must contain an implementation process and schedule for completion of the small area plans. We now refer to the small area plans as region plans because of the size of the geographic areas they cover. Page 70 in volume one sets out two options for region plan schedule. One was recommended by the Citizen Advisory Committee for Plan 2040, and the other is an alternative recommended by staff. Um, <clears throat> but the region plan order will need to be set by council and staff would ask that if there's any way to discuss this early on in the legislative process and come to some decisions, that staff could actually start pre-planning for the first three region plans. Uh, next slide, please. That concludes our presentation. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of staff here um, that can answer any questions you may have. And uh, we're, we're happy to open for questions. Thank you, Christina, and everyone who spoke. Okay, I see Ms. Hare's flag. So let's start with you, Ms. Hare. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, I'll start with, with just a question on the region plans. And thank you very much, Ms. Pompa. You answered actually a bunch of my region plan questions that had come from my constituents in advance about sort of how that's going to work and, and things like that. But um, I had actually been sort of advocating for quite some time that we do a standalone bill for these for setting the order of these region plans um, in advance so just like you described we could get moving on the first three sooner rather than later i don't know if this is a question for miss pompa or for opc or maybe this is a question for um miss shewitt but how is it how can the council how can we accomplish that first Via a new a standalone bill, do we? What is it that we need to do to get that piece going first? I would need to defer to um, the Office of Law on that, and I believe we have Lori Blair Klassmeyer and Kelly Kenny here. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration. I will I will add some context to that. There has been. Uh, some communication uh, back and forth over the past couple of days as to exactly how it works mechanically. I think I assumed it was done uh, in 11-21, but I think um, uh, there might be an opinion that we might need a standalone bill I defer to Office of Law. Ms. Blair Klausmeyer. Um. I'm sorry, I, I lost the end of the question. Sure, so we had been talking, actually, I'm not sure, 
I know Mr. Barron and I had spoken about it a couple of times. I think Mr. Kaisiegler and I had spoken about it a couple of times, trying to get the first three region plans moving because it could cut off some of it. I mean, it's a long period of time that each region plan takes and trying to shorten any time frame and kind of get this along would be a great thing. And so Ms. Pompa actually just mentioned that in her remarks. And my question is from a practical standpoint, how can the council accomplish that? Can we approve the order of the region plans in advance as a standalone bill, how is it that we can get that order moving first so that planning and zoning can start putting together the groups who will uh, work on these region plans while we evaluate the rest of the GDP? Got it. Um, if I recall correctly, the order of the plans, the order of the, yeah, the order of the regional plans is part of the plan, or at least it's suggested in the plan. So, and I believe that the plan also talks about how those, um, committees, for lack of a better word, better word, I'm not sure if they're called something else, but um, is going to be set up. I I wouldn't see there being an issue with at least starting that process of setting up those committees before. I mean, this bill is going to take a while, and then it's got 45 days, and I get it. We're, you know, 90 to 120 days down the road before anything, you know, can happen. But I, I would not see an issue if, if to begin to set up those committees and you know begin that discussion um at least for the ones that we think are going to be the first three or four or whatever the however they're set out in the plan right so the plan calls we have to the council has to set it to my understanding has to set which three go oh i'm sorry just, just to kind of speed things along a little bit because i have had some discussions um as we prepare for how we're going to do the gdp over the next couple of months and we did discuss that issue um, it is my understanding based on that background that we do need to do a separate bill if we want to get that started first because the plan contains both a suggested order of regions and an alternative, and alternative right. suggested order of regions. So we can't, whatever we adopt, we're going to have to do a separate bill. Um, and we can, we can certainly discuss that um, in looking at our overall schedule. I don't think we would possibly do that before a bill like that before say March 1st um, but you know there's there's a lot for everybody I wanted to make sure that everybody has a chance to start considering it before we even proceed with a bill so that it wouldn't be too early also but I agree with with you um, and in the discussions that we that we had it, it would be nice to be able to get going first but uh, let's make sure people have a chance to review. So, um, and we do have a few questions and we also have, I think at 1210, we need to take our 90 minute break. So I just want everybody to be aware of that. Um, and I'll, uh, let's do one question per person, please. Mr. Prusky. Uh, thank you. I had multiple questions, but I'm gonna stick probably the most important one. Um, I know I had some conversations uh, with the planning and zoning office, but I, actually have a concern. The Ovenden Town Center Master Plan uh, is really a five-year plan, and I <coughs> did not get a chance to talk to folks about that, but I do not think, in my personal opinion, um, it should be done along with the area plan. It needs to be done sooner because of the legislative timeline, and I know you all are have a lot going on, so I'm not pushing or anything, but if you could just address that, because I do think it has to be a separate piece. For those of you that don't know on the council, the Ovenden Master Plan is an overlay for the Ovenden Town Center uh, and we review it every five years, according to the code. Um, that five-year period is up. And again, that's why I'm addressing that because we kind of get confused here. It was uh, brought up in the presentation and thank you for doing that, but I just wanna get an update on, on thoughts on that. Thank you. Mr. Kaiziegler. So um, thank you. Um, Councilman Prusky, yes, that is our intent. There will be an update to the Odenton Town Center plan, not necessarily connected to the start of a region plan. And that commences immediately following the um, the adoption of plan 2040. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. I have two questions. My first question is regarding small business um, zoning category. Mm -hmm. So on our planning and zoning website, the small business zoning classification was listed under other. It is in the GDP document, it is listed under commercial. Is there a is there a difference now? And if so, why was it moved from other to commercial? Because I think at least the ones that I'm familiar with for small business zoning classification, they're not 
necessarily commercial in their appearance, but they're not residential in their use. So I think it's more appropriate that they fall under other. And I just have, I wonder why they're now under commercial in this document. Cindy, are you able to address that? Sure, uh, Cindy Carrier with Office of Planning and Zoning. Um, we consider the small business district, uh, or some small business uh, land use category to be the least intensive of our commercial zones. Um, as you mentioned, it does have, they take on more of a residential character, but their uses, um, their highest and best use can be um, a very low intense uh, commercial use. So rather than pull them out separate from the other um, uh, intensity of land use, of commercial land use, such as highway commercial and uh, office commercial, we've, we've lumped this in on the land use map as, um, as commercial. And then during the region plan process, what we need to do is with each of the regions, there's communities that are a part of the regions and each one of those will define sort of what that community is gonna look like. And with certain of our commercial areas, we'll, that'll be defined. We, you know, this is a you know, low intensity um, commercial area, you know, with residential character type pieces. And we would need to keep defining that through the region plan so that we can find um, consistency um, and then also try to um, implement that through a zoning category. Okay, that actually is a- Oh, can I come back to you, Ms. Fiedler? So do one question per person for now, just to try to get through all the questions. Um, yep. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Allison Pickard, D2. I wanted to first take a minute just to commend and thank uh, the entire team um, for putting this all together over the last couple of years. I know it's a lot of work. Um, obviously, there's a lot of policy goals in this plan uh, that I look forward to supporting. I do have roughly about 14 pages of questions, so I doubt I'm going to get to them all today. Um, so. I know sometime today we'll probably talk about the next work sessions that are being planned to address some of these questions publicly, but I'm not even sure which one to start with. So let me start with, I'm going to try to go general to more specific if I can. You can do one question, please, Ms. Pickard. Okay, I know. I'm just going to do my one. Okay. Um, there's a lot of things. Um, in the GDP with the explanation or rationale as neighbor neighborhood preservation um, and things like community character. Um, how when when crafting the document and working with the stakeholders, how do we meet um, how do I say this? How does that policy goal of neighborhood preservation intersect with modern housing as it's developed and attainable price points in the county? Well, let, let me start, Steve Kaisigler. And, and this is the, um, I'm gonna say the challenging magic that goes from adopting a general development plan with policy objectives into code language. And, uh, and, and it's, I don't think there's going to be a very specific answer for your question. Um, it takes people gathering and talking about what the policies mean. You take into account the existing character of a neighborhood. If you have vacant lands and you're going to allow other types of, as an example, residential zoning, does it have to look kind of exactly or sort of like what was already there? Or are we interested in other types of, I'm going to say, residential dwelling units, ownership options, and as you said, price points. And that is going to be one of our challenges as, as both the administration and the council have a keen interest in promoting, I'm going to use more affordable and workforce housing, 
some of it will occur within existing communities. And that, that, is, that is the difficult part of this. And as you know, as we work with individual council members on, on the individual pieces of legislation that we have, that's, that's the challenging part of the discussion, whether it's sheds and whether they need permits or where they can be located, how does it work within the character of those neighborhoods to ADUs and all kinds of other things. So it's a great question. And when you have to go through a process, the journey in getting there is, is the key thing. Okay, Ms. Fiedler, do you wanna ask your next question? And then I'll go to Mr. Prusky if we have time before break. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. So my follow-up question to my previous question is just to clarify um, what we will be able to do when we get to the regional plans. So if, if a land use change or staff recommendation, um, let me figure out how, many, how to word this. If, if a, an underlying land use doesn't change during the plan 2040 bill, can we then not uh, make zoning changes during regional or we can still? If, if, if I could, I, I think I understand your question. Again, Steve Kaiziglar, and this is one that we've been talking about extensively. You know, the key thing with the GDP, you're going to have a land use map and it has um, recommendations. And in not every case um, does the, uh, the GDP's land use map uh, resolve uh, a LUCA request. So you're going to move from GDP into a region plan. And it might be that you get a request or there's consideration of rezoning a piece of property in a way that is inconsistent with the GDP's land use map. There's still the ability for the council to approve that rezoning. What we would say is there needs to be a companion minor amendment to the GDP. This is not a, um, it's a fairly common approach used throughout the state to ensure that at the end of the day with this, I'm gonna use the word transaction, that the GDP and the region plan, land use map and zoning are all consistent. So if we're gonna make a change legislatively, we wanna make sure the guiding documents support that. I hope that answers your question. I think it does. <laughs> the, the point is through the region planning process, it uses the GDP land use map as a guide, but we recognize that there may be, I'm gonna say zoning changes, land use changes in the region plans that differ from the GDP. That is probably going to happen. And if there's going to be a move to do that, what we're saying is we need to reconcile that change with the GDP through a minor amendment to the GDP at the same time. The GDP is, is, is not, we don't intend for the GDP to be a static um, document that is never altered change throughout its, I'm gonna say 10 year lifespan. We're expecting through the region planning process, there are going to be decisions made, legislative decisions that may be at least um, give the appearance of a conflict with the GDP. We want at the end of the day though, to have GDP, region plan land use and region plan zoning to be consistent with each other. That means if there is an inconsistency, we fix the inconsistency. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, it is 12.09. We are supposed to start our break at 12.10. I'd like to know whether um, if we were to take a break for 10 minutes and come back, are there any council members who would not be able to rejoin us so I could prioritize a question from you before we go on break? Mr. Prusky. Yeah, Madam Chair, I have a cutoff at 12.30 um, that, that, so I could be here for a little bit, but then I'll have to head out. Okay, um, maybe wave your flag or your hand if you have <laughs> an answer to that question as opposed to you wanna make a comment. Okay, because if, if you all can come back, then I said, let's take our break now so we can come back at 1220 um, and then hopefully we'll be able to answer lots of questions for 90 minutes and then be done. Madam Secretary, is that okay? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm here. I'm ready to pause the meeting and get our recess slide up. Okay, so let's recess until 1220.
Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Yes, Madam Chair. Ms. Lacey. Present. Ms. Picker. Present. Mr. Volke did have to leave the meeting. He let me know that. He's not here. Mr. Prusky. Here. Ms. Fiedler. Present. Ms. Bradvian's not here. Ms. Hare. Present. Susan Smith, Ms. Madam Auditor. Present. Madam, okay, thank you. Madam Legislative Council, Linda Schuett. Here. Thank you. Everyone is accounted for, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Okay, so it is uh, 1223. We are going to go until one o'clock and then we will end this work session. Um, there are obviously lots of questions, so we will be taking <coughs> more work sessions to be had. So watch your email for um, scheduling. My understanding is that both Ms. Hare and Mr. Kruski need to leave at 1230. So I'm gonna focus on getting their questions out first and then I'll swing back around to my remaining colleagues. Mr. Prusky. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Andrew Prusky, District 4. So I certainly have some more specific questions, but I want to go in an overarching one. This council had a presentation about a month or two ago from the garrison commander of Fort Meade. And I know that that was not, um, it was supposed to be earlier, planned earlier. And uh, with that, the garrison commander kind of mentioned the addition of seven to 8,000 people uh, at Fort Meade. And this is the difficulty I have in my area. If I could tell everybody that we're not gonna develop, we're not gonna do anything, that's great. But guess what? Then our roads are gonna get packed. People are gonna live somewhere, right? And we can't tell the federal government what to do. Uh, but what I, I guess my question is, is that when we talk about these plans that we had the public meeting, how did that get discussed? Was it discussed? Um, because certainly I think a lot of people don't understand that when BRAC happened, and this was prior to my term, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with BAC, it's the base realignment. Uh, commission that kind of brought all that growth to Fort Meade uh, and Fort Meade being the, the largest employer. Again, getting to my point here is that I was just curious if, if that was also presented because it provides a challenge to us as a county, right? We have no say over federal land and employment. And, and so I'm struggling, right, with these comments and things that are coming in, but I also want to be transparent with people, um, you know, about that. So if, if you just get an overall general comment, if that was included in the plans, that was discussed as part of the public participation, because uh, it's it's certainly a challenge uh, for me as, as I go forward. Thank you. Cindy, can you address that since you have been here longer than the rest of us? Um, sure, Cindy Carrier, Office of Planning, so I'm mean, a little bit of trouble um, with my connection, so maybe one of the other staff can take over if I drop off. Um, so yes, it was addressed. We, um, if, if you go back to our development policy area map, you'll note that um, it is, um, that the Fort Meade area um, is considered one of our critical economic areas. And as we get into the region plans, we'll define a little better, um, you know, where we, some of these decisions on housing. We've got, you know, um, several um, planned as far as staff recommendations for um, mixed use around our transit uh, centers. Um, so we, we have addressed housing in the area near Fort Meade with the hope that people can um, live and work near, you know, well, live near where they work. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. I just want to circle back real briefly on the interplay between this document, the GDP, and the regional plans. Um, in a number of the LUCAs, sort of countywide, we see this recommendation from planning and zoning that further evaluation of parcel X should be considered during the regional plan process when a more comprehensive land use is developed for wherever it, it may be. Um, my takeaway from some of these is that some of these are kind of close calls and it really depends. Maybe a parcel is in a transition area in, a, in some part of the county um, and it really sort of depends on where the community wants to take that area. Um, do I have that correct? Because some of these Lucas, if I'm looking at them, I can see it in multiple ways. Do I have it correct that essentially we're just saying 
look, this is a transition, or maybe it's maybe it's appropriate as commercial, maybe it's appropriate as residential, maybe it's appropriate, but we're asking the community specifically to look at this in the next iteration of this, because I wanna make sure if, if this is supposed to be setting the policies, I wanna make sure that we're not just kicking the can down the road, but that we're actually asking the regional plans to take a specific action. Um, and that that's really the intent behind this. Uh, Councilwoman here, I'll go ahead and take that for you. Um, I think that our vision, there are a lot of cases where we did suggest that the decision should happen during the region plan and not during the GDP, mainly because you will have a more focused group of stakeholders on the advisory committee from that geographic area. And I think that the vision for those smaller geographic areas can be more easily realized during, during the region plan processes. And as Mr. Kai Ziegler mentioned in his answer to one of Ms. Fiedler's questions, um, we do envision that the land use the planned land use map will change during the region planning process and as well as you know zoning will happen so that was the reason that many of the decisions were pushed further down the road because this is a more general approach it is our general development plan may i ask one follow-up madam chair go ahead okay thank you um knowing that i, I think i saw in here that there's going to be I mean, nine uh, people from each region, that was the committee, something like nine people on the committee. Um, do you feel like you can accomplish that with some of these really large geographical areas that they will really be able to dig into the weeds in that sense and make those decisions down the road any differently than we could make them now? Yes, Th thank you, Councilwoman here. And I'm sorry, this is Christina Pompa from OPZ. Um, so we have identified that there needs to be a minimum of nine people on the stakeholder advisory committees for the region plans. There could be more. Okay. The other thing is, remember the robust engagement process that the slide that Michael Stringer showed you with all the meetings? We're also going to have engagement during the region plan process when people be can become involved. So. And it will be people from that region rather than people from the entire county. So I do think at the region plan, there will be an opportunity um, to dive in at a deeper level. And there will be more than just the advisory committee uh, influencing what happens. Thank you, that was super helpful. Um, Mr. Pruski, do you have any more questions before you have to go? No, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, thanks for your time. Same with Ms. Hare. So we are on to Ms. Pickard. Question number two on page one, right? I'm skipping around a little bit just to stress everybody out, including myself. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Allison Pickard, D2. Um, I, I'm a little all over the place. You're gonna hear a lot from me in these work sessions, but um, the mixed use designation um, seems to be a key component to redevelopment and revitalization of, of some of our vacant commercial property has been discussed earlier today, but there's also language in this document removing mixed use designations um, or you putting them uh, to work in very targeted areas. I'm concerned that, um, and would like to understand how 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 you guys see mixed use designations um, altering in this document, but also then in regional planning and then code revisions. Because there's some places where we're removing mixed use altogether, um, or we're saying we want mixed use in just um, town centers or targeted growth areas. But to be honest, we have vacant commercial space in pockets um, all over the county that may not ever revive as pure commercial use based on the way the world works these days and mixed use um, could be essential there 
Otherwise, we're just going to see vacant, dilapidated buildings. Uh, Councilwoman Pickard, this is Christina Pompa from OPC again. I'm going to make one comment about this, and then I'm going to ask either Cindy or Michael to chime in with me. Um, we are aware that the COVID-19 pandemic is going to have impacts on land use for decades to come. And there may be places where we have commercial land use today that really would be better served to be mixed use later on down the line. And I think we have opportunities during the region plans to actually address that. Um, because again, the land use map can change during the region plan process and then comprehensive zoning can follow. So we have built in the flexibility to be able to flex and change as we need to with the economy, with the region plan process. And Cindy or Michael, I don't know if you have more that you'd like to add there. Um, sure, Cindy Carrier, Office of Planning and Zoning. Um, so just one thing I'll add is when you say um, altering mixed use, we do have a recommendation to um, review our existing mixed use zoning categories. Um, they have not um, worked in the way I think that they were originally intended. And um, so I think it, it is upon us to make sure that um, we do analyze um, the existing uh, zoning categories and their requirements and to uh, revise them as necessary to make them work um, the way that we need them to. Um, so that is that is a recommendation in the plan and just following up on the land use piece of that I you know I do we have specifically um, outlined some area or designated some areas in plan 2040 that should be mixed use um, primarily in our targeted areas um, which include um, existing mixed use areas um, the around some of our transit stations and um, uh, but we could also see, you know, mixed use occurring in some of these village centers, which would be targeted area, and on our commercial uh, revitalization area, which are our targeted areas as well. And, um, you know, potentially in the critical economic area with more input from uh, residents and regions. I don't know if Michael, do you have anything else to add? Ms. Pickard, if you'd like to ask another question, you're muted, or else I'll ask a question. I will allow Madam Chair to ask her question, and then I'll go next. Why, thank you. Um, my question is about the um, the land the land use plan for recreation and parks. I feel like it was LBPRP or something. Um, can you talk about how we will sort of address or evaluate that plan in view of the GDP, um, especially in areas where maybe regional area plans haven't been done yet, because I can think of a couple of uh, projects where the community is interested in one type of recreational use and it's a completely different kind of recreational use from the existing recreational use. They're so conflicting that it might, in some sense, conflict with some other important goal in one of these plans. And I'm just curious, what's our, what's our method or plan or outlook on those kinds of policy conflict resolution, you know, um, issues that are gonna come up? Ms. Carrier, are you able to answer that question? I will try. Cindy Carrier, Office of Planning and Zoning. We may have to defer this one to our Recreation and Parks Department, but the way that the Land Preservation Park and Recreation Plan um, has always worked in the past, it's also a state mandate that has to follow certain requirements, and one of those is to be consistent with the General Development Plan. So it will continue to be consistent with the plan. Um, it is a, a much more detailed uh, plan in that it 
um, prioritize and specifies um, recreation needs. They do their own analyses. Um, even now it's required that they do an equity analysis on a proximity analysis to make sure that um, you know, the, the plant, the recreation needs are equitable across the, the county and, and prioritize them that way. Um, and Plan 2040 is broad in its recreation and um, park preservation goals. So I don't, I don't see any conflicts arising. Some regions may need to um, wait, you know, some, some time. Uh, but then again, the, the LPPRP is a countywide plan. So, you know, they, they and it's upcoming I and mean, it's required. They'll be, they've already started pre-planning for that. So I, I don't see any conflict arising um, out of this. Thank you. Ms. Pickard. Thank you. This is Allison Pickard, uh, D2. And I want to ask a couple questions about the green infrastructure plan, volume two, page 59 to 61 for those following at home. What does, it's two parts, what does protected versus unprotected mean on the map uh, in volume two, page 61? And page 59 indicates that figure eight illustrates the pre preliminary gr draft green infrastructure network. Is this draft map being adopted or approved by passage of the GDP, or will this come forth in a separate bill in the future? Mr. Stringer, will you please answer that question for Councilwoman Pickard? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, Michael Stringer, Office of Planning and Zoning. Um, I'm uh, currently beginning the process of, uh, of picking up and moving to finalization the draft green infrastructure master plan. So what is included in plan 2040 is draft documentation that was completed um, in 2018. Um, there was extensive uh, analysis and engagement with stakeholders conducted in 2017 and 2018 to update the green ways plan and re reframe it as a green infrastructure plan. And um, so that's where that information is coming from. Um, the so the green infrastructure master plan will uh, do will up, do updated analysis. Basically, that that plan was put um, on hold while we work through the general development plan. The staff limitation of capacity and prioritization of the general development plan kind of put that on hold for an interim time. So that will come forward to council. Um, our schedule is to get that to you by the end of this year um, for review as an updated standalone plan. The protected unprotected status is, is analysis that we do through that process. Um, protected includes uh, several different categories uh, of types of protection from outright uh, ownership by you know, public agency for natural resource uh, utilization. Also incorporates things like uh, conservation easements either held on uh, by private land trusts or the Maryland Environmental Trust, um, our agricultural and woodland uh, preservation easements as well as lands protected by um, uh, open space zoning or floodplain regulation. So, excuse me if I may follow up, Madam Chair. So then the, the, the lighter green portion that's unprotected, are we going to be seeing an updated uh, green infrastructure plan that now pulls that land into some sort of protected status or and is it is it county owned or privately owned land? I, I'm not following the unprotected part. Okay. The uh, um, if I may respond to uh, Michael Stringer, um, Office Planning and Zoning. So the I kind of I detailed the the protected side. Un unprotected would be yes, pr privately owned land, typically um, without any of those type of protections, like a conservation easement on it, and that sort of sets your target for if we're prioritizing our land conservation efforts in a sense. The green infrastructure plan is pointing to saying these are areas to focus efforts for land acquisition or uh, conservation easements, either through county or partnerships with with private and nonprofit entities. If I may, Madam Chair, you may. Allison Pickard, D two. So we had lengthy discussions about. Um, greenways and things like that in the in the forest conservation bill, and I'm I'm you know, mindful of the the privately owned nature of some of this unprotected land and what that means 
for landowners, those that private have privately held land in the critical area are informed of the status that they own land in the critical area. Is that a goal of this the administration to inform folks that we're creating a map that designates them in some sort of green protected status? And uh, Councilwoman Pickard, uh, the Pete Barron, uh, it's a great question. Let me confirm, I think so, but we'll have to get back to you. And maybe Steve knows off the top of his head. If, if, if I could, Steve Kaiziegler, um, Planning and Zoning Officer. I don't believe we're planning on doing it the way you asked the question, um, uh, Councilwoman Pickard, in the sense, will we send a postcard or a letter or provide notice? And I say that because um, the process that we're engaged in now, the GDP has already been underway for over three years with massive citizen participation. You know, frankly, anybody who has a piece of property in the county, this is the kind of thing that they, they start paying attention to. Um, we are open and willing to sharing any information that we have. The, the uh, Greenways map would be an example of we would be doing that, but I'm assuming your question was, are we going to provide notice to 600,000 residents directly? And, and no, we're not. And if, if I can just add, I think Matt Johnston is here. If he might have something to add to, to some of this is maybe I have to ask Madam Administrator to, to call him up, but I think he is in the Zoom room. Mr. Johnston was here earlier. We're looking to see if he's still here. <laughs> um, oh, I do. I, I think he's come up. There he is. Well, I made a bit, uh, for the record, Matthew Johnston, um, Environmental Policy Director for the County Executive, made a bit of a, of a change here. I don't have the tie on any longer, but thanks, uh, Mr. Barron. So I just wanted to follow up on that, Ms. Pickard, um, to clarify what the green infrastructure on protected areas are and are not. It's, it's important to clarify that they are not regulatorily protected areas. Just having the map there does not uh, garner any automatic protections for that map, like the critical area would. But what they do does it, what they do show the citizens and the council are the areas that are most likely wetlands, most likely stream buffers, and most likely the priority forests that this council agreed to protect in the in the forest conservation bill. So those 75 acre contiguous forests. So through the development process, um, they could be protected via other code, uh, via other sections of the code, but just having them on the map in and of themselves does not designate them as protected like the critical area would. I hope that helps. It does, thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. And I apologize, I wrote down a page number and it's not correct. Um, so ephemeral streams were um, mentioned in this document and I have not been able to find the counterpart at the state or federal level. Is Can you lend some thoughts to this new uh, terminology? Um, Mr. Stringer, would you be able to take that question for Councilwoman Fiedler? I could, but I, I think I might defer to Matt to Mr. Johnston since he's on. Sure, sure, uh, Councilwoman Fiedler. For the record, Matt Johnston, County Executive's Office. Um, there are three types of, of streams typically designated by the USGS or uh, the state, and those are ephemeral, um, intermittent, and perennial. Perennial are the kinds of streams you'd know. You're walking by a stream, you see water in it all the time. You know it, it's there. Intermittent are the types of streams that um, occasionally have water in them. And ephemeral are the types of streams where in right now, the late winter and early spring, we're pretty sure that there will be water in those drainage areas. They do have distinctly different definitions and across other comprehensive plans, across other jurisdictions in Maryland, the three have started to be broken out in the plans and in their code so that it's very clear ephemeral is very different than perennial um, and it should have different uh, uh, protections associated with it so i think there are three very different types of streams and our code does not currently break them out in that way uh, 
Um, I, I would like to add to that, if possible, uh, Councilwoman Fiedler, the reference to ephemeral streams is actually on page 74 of volume one. And it's a strategy that calls out for prohibiting disturbance within 25 feet of ephemeral streams, unless the disturbance is related to water quality improvement projects, stormwater management, or existing utility crossings. Thank you, Ms. Pampa. I had the right page, wrong volume. <laughs> Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Allison Pickard, D2. Um, the, uh, in volume one, page 39, um, I'm, I'm wondering if this map, it's appropriate to reflect the newly established Glen Burnie Sustainable Communities Overlay Area. Uh, this is Christina Pompa with OPZ. Uh, Councilwoman Pickard is referring to the Development Policy Areas map. And I think it may be appropriate, um, but I would like to defer to my colleague, Cindy Carrier. Oh, actually, Mr. Ziegler has his hand up. And Steve Kai Ziegler, and yes, it is appropriate. We will. So I can start drafting that amendment? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, check that one off. I have more questions. Ms. Fiedler, do you have more questions? Because if so, we'll continue bouncing one to one until we're out of time at one o'clock. I'm on paper right now. Okay, Ms. Pickard, go ahead. Volume one, Allison Pickard, D2, volume one, page 89. Uh, built environment 1.1, 16 and 17. This calls for removing the BRAC mixed use um, area. What I was just curious about the rationale for that change. Uh, Ms. Carrier, are you able to take that? And Ms. Pickard, could you just repeat which uh, strategy it is, please? Oh, 16 on page 89. Cindy Carrier, Office of Planning and Zoning. So we have incorporated that BRAC mixed use area within the plan itself. I'm sorry, what does that mean? Um, so it was a area that was designated um, after the 2009 GDP and um, has its own set of code um, that no longer is needed at this point if we are going to incorporate it into the plan. So, so the designations still exist? They just don't, I'm not following, well, I'm sorry. So on our development policy area map, you will note that we have included this as a mixed use area. Okay, that's what I need. Uh, okay, I gotcha. Thanks. Well, to clarify, I think what I heard is since BRAC is basically a legacy designation because the BRAC program is over, then these areas are still going to be mixed use. We just don't need to call them BRAC mixed use anymore. Is that right? I see lots of nods of heads. <laughs> okay. And um, I'll jump in with another um, question. I know we, we've we talked a little bit about um, how we make, about the, the nine regions, grouping them into three, and then proceeding to the regional area plans. And um, I guess the question that keeps bugging me is that it doesn't seem really fair that, that three groups three regions will have to wait until six years from now, basically, to even start on their plan. I'm curious, you know, what, what resources would it really take? Where can we find resources to, you know, to try to make the three sets of region plans that to make that process either overlap or to, you know, set it 
just after where like when phase one for the first region plan is done, that's when you're beginning phase one for the second region plan. And so it's rolling much closer in time. I just, I have this fundamental feeling of, of it's somehow unfair. Um, and I'm not sure how to reconcile that with it's just the plan. So any thoughts? Uh, Council Chair Lacey, I'm happy to field that question. So we have laid out a general schedule on page 70 of volume one, uh, which shows the first three region plans starting immediately after adoption of the GDP. And then we would launch the next three in approximately October of 2022. And then the next and final group launching in April 2024. Really, um, that schedule is driven by limitations in staff resources within the Office of Planning and Zoning. Uh, we basically believe that it will take a senior planner and coupled with either a planner one, two, or three to do each of the region plans. And so if we wanted to accelerate the region planning process, we would really need more staff resources in order to do it. Um, and then there's the general question of, all right, so if you get them all done more quickly and you've brought that staff on, uh, are, are you going to be able to keep them busy? Uh, so for right now, for the staff that we do have, that is what that's what we can do. Plus the fact, as Councilman Prusky mentioned, there's the Odenton Town Center Master Plan. Councilwoman Pickard mentioned the Green Infrastructure Plan. There's the Parole Town Center Master Plan and the Water and Sewer Master Plan. They all are up for being updated. So the work program is very full right now. Obviously, our office is not opposed to doing more region plans if we had more staff resources. And I don't know if Mr. Kai Ziegler would like to add anything to what I have said. I, I would. Thank you, Christina. Steve Kai Ziegler, Planning and Zoning Officer. This has been a constant topic of discussion with our office and the administration. And the reality is we can do what we can do kind of with the staff that we have, barely. Um, part of, you know, I'd like to say that we could do all nine region plans at the same time. When the county undertook its small area planning process, when they started that 20 years ago, Office of Planning and Zoning was about three times the size it is now. So there's a huge investment to bring full-time employees on. One question you might ask, well, couldn't we do this with consultants? And, and the, I'm going to say the, um, the consulting business has changed dramatically over the years. Who you hire is not necessarily who you really get, companies are bought left and right. You still have to manage a consultant. They're very, very expensive to bring in. You have discontinuity in terms of their work with other products that we're producing. So I think our point is we're not opposed to doing more, but we would need more resources to do it. I'd also point out, we're kind of trying to create um, uh, uh, a program where we're calling planning to plan so that we create a scenario for the future of legacy planning in the sense that we do a GDP and then we start updating these nine region plans. And by the time we're done with the nine region plans, it's time to redo the GDP. And in the midst of all that, as Christine indicated, we're updating, you know, uh, Parole Town Center, Odenton Town Center, the Greenways plan, the Master Water Sewer plan. And I'm, I'm sure we'll come up with other plans to update. And I haven't even mentioned updating zoning code zoning and subdivision codes, and all of the other, I'm going to say, legacy regulations that other departments have, such as stormwater management, transportation, all of those. So we hear you that it seems a little unfair, but it's a reality of the times and resources that we have. Can I follow up with a brief question, which is, have you reached out to, um, I'm just curious, you know, can you get interns? Can you get um, you know, folks who are studying for their master's degrees and planning or things like that to also be able to help. I'm wondering just if there are other ways that we haven't explored yet, and perhaps you have explored them all, but I'd like We to have. Um, Steve Kaiser, <laughs> again, um, we actually will be working with University of Maryland on a PALS project probably in the fall. They're not really set up with interns, and, um, you know, I have, as you know, I've worked with Christine in other places. 
interns can be fantastic. Uh, and I've had those experiences and I've also had the other experience, but they're, they're not anywhere near um, uh, a response to trying to staff up to do major programmatic work. They're, they're just not. So we think every way we can, I mean, uh, there's been a lot of suggestions on the consultant side and it's an area I'm just not, I'm not willing to go because my experience has, has been that it just doesn't produce the results that we need in a timely manner. So I, I, uh, if, if there are other options out there that we haven't thought about, I'm very open. At the end of the day, if we're gonna try and do the work that we're undertaking and do it faster, I think we're just gonna need more resources. Keep, keep in mind that the work program we're talking about now with the GDP, uh, starting three region plans, updating four master plans, basically all at the same time is more programmatic planning work than the county's undertaken in the last 10 to 15 years. So we're undertaking a massive workload. And, and I, wish, I wish we had the staffing to do it all at the same time, but it's, uh, it costs money to do that. Yeah, I'm just of the view that since it's so important, we shouldn't short shift any resources to be able so, to, you know, uh, these plans. And so I think that's what's frustrating is it feels like some of the plans take so long to be made. And then if it, by the time you roll around to whatever is the next group that finally gets to have their plan, they're saying, yeah, but you're going to do the other plan next, you know. Um, and we have to make a decision here pretty soon over which regions to start with, which in my mind is weighing heavily as an important decision to, to be thinking about, so. Agreed. If I could add one more thing. Um, Please. We, we understand this. This has been, like I said, a major topic of discussion with last year's budget cycle, with this year's budget cycle. We are asking for additional staff, but primarily based on what how how difficult the work is to do and how transparent we're trying to be and invite the public in, we're thinking we need what we're asking for in this year's budget to be able to do the work we've kind of committed to doing. It's not to take on a lot of new work. But the other thing that has come up, and I've, I've heard this from other council members, the fairness issue, and, and typically where that revolves around is someone who is expecting an opportunity to request a rezoning of their property. And, and I, I think there has been thought that if you're in the later stages of the region planning process, you won't have your opportunity. I think we recognize that some of the region plans will start later than sooner. And so we are right now, the county is open for piecemeal rezonings, meaning change or mistake. We already have a couple applications. In. I don't have any objections for at least the later planning processes for region plans if we maintain that for them so that, you know, if, if they're thinking they're going to have to wait five years, eight years, which they really won't, and they need to get an application in the rezone, they will have that opportunity. They have it today. So they, there's avenues that, that, you know, people who might live or reside in a region plan, it isn't going to happen for a couple of years, can ask the important questions they want is, can my, my, can my property be rezoned? I cannot begin to tell you the recommendation we would make on any of those individual ones, but the avenue is there for, is there for them to pursue it. Thank you, that's helpful. And we're at one o'clock. Ms. Pickard, would you like to ask a final question before we wind up for today? Yeah, I, I would actually, because it, it's come to my attention, Allison Pickard D2, it's come to my attention that we might be doing a separate bill sooner than passing this whole GDP about our region plans. So I'm just curious, and, and I hope we might have this opportunity to talk again um, in another work session prior to a bill being put before the council to choose regions, but is there, for the ones that um, have been proposed to begin May 2021, can, can anyone shed some light on why they were chosen? from a planning perspective, um, um, what would well, help? Well, Councilwoman Pickard, Christina Pompa with OPZ. Uh, I keep forgetting to introduce myself. Um, so the Citizen Advisory Committee, um, their recommendation for the order of the region plans was actually done through a survey monkey vote. Um, and so all of the members that were in attendance at that meeting weighed in on the order that they wanted to see for the region plans. And so that is um, 
that is how that order was created. And then there were some comments and staff believes that there is some, uh, there are some reasons why we may want to look at region seven um, in the first group, which is around the Annapolis and Annapolis neck area. Uh, so that is generally how they, those orders came into being. And Ms. Carrier, I don't know if you want to add anything, any more detail about the staff recommendation. Yes, thank you, Ms. Pompa. Uh, Cindy Carrier, Office of Planning and Zoning. Um, the staff recommendation is based on um, looking at where we see the highest growth pressure and that's, we you know, use parameters such as, you know, where we've seen the most development applications recently, um, where we had the most um, land use change applications, and then kind of also looked at a geographic spread, councilmatic spread. That's, you know, how we are derived our um, staff recommendation, recommended order. So the from the CAC to the alternative to the staff alternative, there's a difference between four and seven regions four and seven. Um, okay, okay. I don't have any. We we're gonna keep talking. I'm sure, but it's I'm I'm hungry, so we can let everybody go. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is um, our loopy hour starts by ten o'clock. In, at night, but right now we're at hungry as wolves hour where we can't think straight anymore. So that said, the next meeting of the county council will be at six o'clock on Monday, February 16th, 2021. I'm sorry, Tuesday. Um, and, uh, and we will be scheduling other work sessions specifically for the GDP. So stay tuned and thank you all for being here all this time today. Take care. Thank you.